tonight. Donald Trump, Joe Biden, face to face on the debate stage for the first time. I think I prepare every day. I can hardly wait to debate it. Will the president go for personal attacks against Biden? People say he was on performance enhancing. Yeah. And can Biden keep the focus on the pandemic and Trump's record? It's bizarre the things he's saying and doing with regard to COVID. A political clash, months in the making, is about to begin. Good evening, I'm Chuck Todd, and welcome to NBC News' special coverage of the 2020 presidential debates right here on NBC News Now. 35 days until Election Day, and right now, we are now just one hour from the start of this first debate between President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden, the first of three scheduled debates, by the way. You are looking live at the debate site in Cleveland, Ohio, where a socially distanced crowd will be in attendance. Everyone in that debate hall is being tested for the coronavirus and everyone other than the candidates and the moderator will be wearing a mask. There will be no pre-debate handshake and not even an elbow bump. Those are just a few of the reminders tonight that this debate is taking place amid a raging global pandemic that has killed more than 200,000 people in the United States and over a million people across the world. And it is unfortunately surging again in quite a few states. Tonight, both sides are gearing up for a fight over a number of issues, but expect the virus to be a major topic. One of Biden's biggest challenges may be his ability to stay focused on the president's handling of the pandemic. The president, well, expect him to try to steer the debate in other directions, any other direction other than the pandemic. He'll obviously want to speak about the economy and perhaps make, uh, make the issue of unrest in American cities a bigger deal. As the front runner in this race, former Vice President Joe Biden has the most to lose tonight. His performances during the Democratic primary debates were, to be charitable, uneven at best. And trailing in the polls, President Trump is expected to attack Biden in highly personal terms. As we've seen from past debates, the president and his team are no strangers to employing tactics that would otherwise signal desperation. Or maybe that's exactly what they're signaling, desperation. Let's dive right in. Let's head to Cleveland and catch up with our NBC News reporters following the campaign. Allie Jackson's inside the debate hall following President Trump. And Mike Memoli is socially distanced outside the debate hall following Vice President Joe Biden. So, Hallie, you're inside that hall. You know, the buzz of a presidential debate without people in attendance, it's got to be yes. odd. It's different, right? And I was actually talking to somebody who has done these things before and talked about, yeah, you come in and typically you do some networking, you go around, you know, the hall would be filling up by now an hour before the debate. You talk to people, you see what's up. It is definitely not like that. Um, I'm looking behind me. I just want to kind of show you here. So the seats are not socially distant, uh, the seats themselves, but there are signs that you can't see from this angle that say, you know, don't sit here. We're enforcing social distance. So people will be spaced out inside the auditorium. People will be sort of in family pods as well. You're seeing every single person here is in a mask. That's not because they want to be. Maybe they do. It's because they have to be, right? Every one of us is required to wear a mask. The only exceptions are going to be the three people who will be on the stage behind me there, and that is moderator Chris Wallace and then both of the presidential right. candidates. Everybody needs a COVID test as well, and I think you set it up nicely at the top of your show here, Chuck. That is a very vivid reminder of the backdrop yeah. to all of this, which is the coronavirus pandemic. It is going to come up. It is going to be an issue in this debate tonight, and Joe Biden's team, as Mike Memoli well knows, is going to be looking to go potentially for the jugular here against President Trump. The president, for his part, uh, is, has arrived in Cleveland. And what is, is his campaign talking about? Listen, they're talking about earpieces. They're talking about, you know, this potential drug test, these conspiracy theories that have gained a lot of traction online about Joe Biden. Uh, right. and, and that is sort of the, the thinking there. Now, there's other pieces to this, too. I do think you're going to hear something about Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, some attacks against him. That is something that campaign aides have been previewing, frankly, for the last 24 hours. It would be surprising to not hear that. President Trump, and just to give you an indication of where that's going, Who's been helping the president prep for this debate? Rudy Giuliani, somebody who has been among sort of Trump world allies, the person who has been leading those attacks against Hunter Biden. And so I do think that gives you a sense of, of the deal here. We do understand that Rudy Giuliani is going to be here as one of the guests inside the debate hall tonight. Another guest, Chuck, uh, Alice Marie Johnson, we understand. She, of course, mm -hmm. is the grandmother who's life sentence was pardoned by President Trump uh, on a drug conviction as part of his right. work on criminal justice reform. So there will be people in the audience. For the president, it's about highlighting, he hopes, and people around him are hoping, his sort of second term, what he would do if he won again. But as you well know, Chuck, this is a president that often uh, likes to yeah. sort of ish air grievances I, that have happened before. I, I, so I we'll see how that goes. Okay. 
I was just going to say, Hallie, until the second you mentioned it, I was going to ask, does the president have any plans <laughs> to try to tell people what he wants to do in his second term? Because he never has. His entire focus on this campaign has been through the lens of, of trying to uh, delegitimize Joe Biden. Are they that empty right now? Yeah. But you know, it's interesting, Chuck, the people around the president don't, they want him to be talking about a second term, right? When you talk to everybody but the president, there is a discussion of, hey, he's going to be laying out this vision for a second term, some of these concrete pieces. But when the rubber meets the road, it's the president himself who, in a right. setting like this, is going to have to deliver on that. And that's a big question mark here tonight. Mike Memoli, it seems as if is, it, the Joe Biden's biggest challenge is going to be navigating whatever, it, whatever WWE antic <laughs> that, that Donald Trump throws at him. Um, does he have what it takes to take over the debate, though, and not just be sitting there having to respond or parry or where he, well, he will take control of this debate? It seems to me that's his biggest challenge. Well, Chuck, there was a 70-something candidate for president who, about two decades, three decades ago in a presidential debate, used a very successful retort against his opponent. There you go again. And you wonder if that's exactly the kind of thing we're going to hear from Joe Biden a lot tonight. One thing I've heard from aides who've been involved in the debate prep is, you know, perhaps you precondition the audience in the earliest opportunity possible to say, listen, America, we know who Donald Trump is. It's something Biden has said often on the campaign trail. Yeah. We need to tell them who we are. But the other thing about this, Chuck, is you used the right term. Those 11 debate performances we saw in the presidential primaries were uneven. But why is Joe Biden the nominee? Because Joe Biden sold himself to Democrats as the best candidate to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donald Trump. And despite all those uh, uneven debate performances, Democrats believe that was true. He took the fight to Donald Trump in the very first moments of his candidacy in that video. And so that's the Dem Democrat people want to see on stage tonight. They want to see Joe Biden take the fight to him. But, Chuck, you wonder if this approach would be different if he was trailing versus ahead. And I think to right. the two primetime debate performances Joe Biden had in 2008 against Sarah Palin, in 2012 against Paul Ryan. In 2008, he was the, the you know, on defense, stand back. You had to be very careful debating Sarah Palin, especially when they were in the lead. In 2012, after Barack Obama had a very weak debate performance right. uh, against Mitt Romney, they needed Joe Biden to turn it up to a 12 and go really for the jugular against Paul Ryan, light some fire into the ticket. Biden really has a difficult balancing act, I think, to play tonight because he does need to show that fight. And Biden and say he wants to bring the fight, but so much of the preparation has also been about how to play defense, how right. do you deal with President Trump's attacks. And that's we'll, we'll see how that prep plays out, because one thing, Chuck, in all the conversations we'd have with Biden allies before other debates, they'd you know, preview with his approach for the night, and then we'd see something entirely different on stage. And there's right. no predicting what we're going to see, especially against Donald Trump tonight. Very quickly, Hallie gave me a roster of, of people that are showing up for Trump. Who's showing up for Biden? Well, we know Dr. Biden's going to be there. His sister, Valerie, is also going to be there. Uh, one of the uh, invited guests is Kristen Urquiza. That's a familiar name. She, of course, had, had a big role at the Democratic Convention, uh, saying her father had only one pre-existing condition before his death of COVID, which was trusting Donald Trump. That's it. We don't know if any other members of the Biden family. Obviously, a big question, as we know, Hunter Biden will be part of the debate tonight, if not in the audience himself. Allie Jackson and Mike Memoli at the debate site, one inside, one outside, both wearing masks. Stay healthy to the both of you. Let's now head over to Steve Kornacki, the big board. Let's just, might as well have a check the state of the race, where we are heading into the first debate. So Steve, I'm trying to think the last time a candidate had this large of a lead going into a first presidential debate, I guess you got to go back to Bill Clinton and Bob Dole in 1996. Last time, yep, yeah, and the last time an incumbent president went into a debate behind 92, George H.W. Bush. Yeah. And, of course, that's the last incumbent to lose. Here it is. This is the NBC polling average north of eight points. Biden's advantage. It's been steady. It's been consistent. That's what Trump is up against in this thing. And, of course, there's that question of how many people saying in these polls, they've already made up their minds. Can you get people maybe who think that way to reconsider it? That might be part of the challenge here. The other thing is, we know the topics that are going to be addressed in this debate tonight, at least according to the moderator, Chris Wallace. He put a list out, and we've got some polling here on what voters think on these issues. The economy, this is polling that's come out in the last couple of weeks. Who do you trust on this issue? Who do you prefer on this issue? Yep. Variations on that. This is Trump's advantage. 
it, consistent. This is our poll here, a 10-point advantage, 48-38 yep. on the economy. There is, of course, this issue of crime and violence, safety in, in, in the, the streets. You've got a slight, and I mean slight, 43-41 edge there for Trump. Then there's Supreme Court, the Supreme Court vacancy. Trump, as he's nominated Amy Coney Barrett, who do you trust more on filling Supreme Court vacancies? Biden is the one who's got the advantage there. We've seen yep. that in a couple polls now. And then it starts to build for Biden. You get to the coronavirus, yep. double-digit advantage there for Biden on the coronavirus and race relations. Something else Wallace says will come up tonight. That's the biggest issue advantage you see for Biden over Trump. And there's one more that will come up tonight. We weren't sure how to measure this in the polling. It's the question of election integrity. That's going to mm. play a role tonight. This is from a recent CNN poll. They asked, first of all, does the loser of the election have an obligation to accept the results and concede? Overwhelmingly, the answer is yes there. The follow-up is, okay, do you think Trump, do you think Biden, if they're defeated, will accept the results and concede? About two-thirds said they think Biden will. Barely one-third said they think Trump will, if that were to happen. You know, Steve, what jumped out at me in that presentation on issues, that, on, that even on Donald Trump's best issue, he can't break 50. Yeah. He doesn't break 50, no matter how you measure it, even on his best issue of the economy. You look at Biden, we see him breaking 50s in battleground states. We see him breaking 50s when it comes to trust issues. You're just not seeing that with the president right now. It's that question. How many people who say they just definitely won't vote for him or think about it, is that number already too high for him? It, it could very well be. Um, and that's why this debate might be the uh, only debate that has a chance to impact this race. We'll see. Steve Kornacki, thank you for getting Thanks. us started. So joining me now, as she always does for these big nights on NBC News Now, is Casey Hunt, NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent and host of Way Too Early on MSNBC. Joshua Johnson, host of The Week with Joshua Johnson on MSNBC. And Michael Besloss, our NBC News presidential historian. Casey, uh, let me start with this, and I want to get everybody in on this, but I want to start with you. Uh, at the end of the day, the president's behavior uh, today and yesterday. Um, is this the behavior of somebody that thinks he can win an election? Well, it certainly doesn't seem like it's someone who thinks that he is going to win an election. I mean, as you just walked through uh, pretty well with Mike Memoli, uh, how candidates normally think of things when they go in on top is certainly not what we have seen from President Trump, who is essentially trying to, uh, you know, he's embraced a, a conspiracy theory about Joe Biden's earpiece and, you know, potentially what he is ingesting before taking the stage. What's that really setting up for? It's setting up for Donald Trump to be able to make an argument that Joe Biden cheated in the debate if it's very oh, yeah. clear that Joe Biden comes out as, you know, what we may define as the winner in this, in this debate, or at least you know, comes out after delivering a strong performance. And, you know, that's the tactic that Donald Trump has taken time and time again, and it's the groundwork that he's laying for the election as a whole, you know, as, as reflected in those numbers that Steve Kornacki had about right. whether Americans believe that they'll, these guys are going to accept the results of the election. Joshua Johnson, it, it, it does, I think, present, you know, at the end of the day, we know Donald Trump is Donald Trump. And in some ways, I don't know if there's new information that's going to be learned by anybody tonight. <laughs> the new information is in Joe is about is going to be with sort of Joe Biden. How does he handle Trump? It it seems to me it's in some ways it could be a trap. You know, is he better off just ignoring the WWE antics, or does he have to does he have to punch him a little? Good question. I think there will be some punching. I'm pretty sure we could expect at least one or two punches to be thrown. But you know that old adage about wrestling with a pig. You just get mm -hmm. dirty and the pig has fun. I think that the Biden campaign knows that. If you look at some of the campaign ads that have been running in the last few weeks, one of them is just part of the Democratic National Committee speech that he gave. There's no music. There's no effects. There aren't even any fades in it. It's just him giving a very presidential style speech. And I think that's on purpose. I think the idea is to paint Joe Biden as someone who could actually be a presidential-ish president, who feels like a president, as opposed to President Trump, who rose to power by making it very clear that he wasn't that kind of a person, that he was a businessman and a bomb thrower. That is why, I think, as Casey mentioned rightly, a lot of what we've heard from the Trump campaign is that same kind of bomb throwing, you know, anti-Washington right. establishment behavior that kind of swept him into office. Whether or not he's going to engage on that, 
I don't know. I don't know politically what makes the most sense in terms of grabbing that 11 percent of voters that our polling has shown haven't settled 100 percent on a candidate yet. But based on what we've heard from him so far, unless the president mm -hmm. makes it personal, unless he comes after his family, he may or may not even bother to go after Donald Trump. Frankly, I think he's better off just talking policy. If the American people are overwhelmed by the last four years right. and they're ready for things to just calm down, I think the fact that Joe Biden is sleepy might be the best thing for his campaign, because yeah. there are millions of Americans who would really like to rest right now. Michael Betchloss, as a historian, there's there's no historical parallel to Donald Trump. None, nobody none. is <laughs> right. Nobody has ever tried to take the WWE and 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 apply it to presidential debates. But right. this is what he did. He did it four years ago. He's doing it again. My greatest fear is that it's normalizing American politics. I'm watching more uh, candidates farther down the ballot using antics, antics like his or tactics like his, thinking that this is the way to succeed. How, I have to say, how are we going to get rid of that virus out of our politics? Well, I think what happens is if Donald Trump tries that tonight, and you're so right, Chuck, you notice that on his list of personal guests as a UFC fighter. So I guess that's a metaphor for what he's gonna try tonight. But if you look back through history, and I don't think it's changed in 2020, the guy who walks off the stage tonight where people say that's someone who looks like a president, that's gonna be the person who won. So Donald Trump as a president, as an incumbent, may be making a mistake because look at the first three sets of debates in history. Each one was a perfect setting for an incumbent to be cut down to size. Richard Nixon in 1960, who was trying to make the point, you know, John Kennedy is a young backbencher, not up to my stature. I, who have debated Nikita Khrushchev and served at Dwight Eisenhower's side for eight years, by the end of that first debate, a lot of people said, JFK looks more presidential. 1976, Gerald Ford, the incumbent president, was saying, Jimmy Carter has no foreign policy experience. Then on the second debate, uh, Ford behaves like a donkey, or that's, uh, there's a party association with donkeys, so I won't use that term, but beh behaves in a really dumb way <laughs> by saying there's no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, and people wonder, this is the guy who knows about foreign policy? Made Jimmy Carter look more presidential. Ronald Reagan in 1980 right. in Cleveland, the same city we're talking about tonight, proved himself a president, so we may see that tonight with Joe Biden. You know, and, and, and Casey, I think that's, you know, I, I've heard a lot of folks try to make the 1980 comparison more than any, right? And there is some, you know, Jimmy Carter um, it was sort of came out of nowhere to be president. Donald Trump came out of nowhere to be president. Jimmy Carter fired his cabinet halfway through. There was always kind of turmoil, always was getting. To, so I understand some of the parallels, I think, do apply. Um, a lot of them don't. Um, this is not comparing the two men on character. It's not even you can't even make that comparison or things like that. But that there is this idea that, boy, all Biden has to do is show up. If he looks presidential, it's game over, and the other two debates may not matter. Do you buy that conventional wisdom, Casey? Well, first of all, I completely agree with you on uh, Jimmy Carter and Donald Trump. It's hard to imagine two no. men of more uh, polar opposite character <laughs> in terms of our, our history uh, of, of in, in presidential politics. Uh, but I, I do think, Chuck, that there's some truth to that. I mean, what would really shake up this relatively stable race where Biden seems to have a sizable lead, where he has been successfully, it seems, making the argument that he has been making for the entire campaign? And he has this going for him, right? If you have a consistent message, it, it works much better than if you're all over the map trying to figure out what you stand for. He's been saying, I stand for a return to normalcy. I stand for a return to decency. And I think one of the things that's in his favor is that it's pretty easy to continue that on the debate stage in the face of nasty attacks from Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It's not as though his responses necessarily are going to counter the basics of that message. But, you know, I do think there's bigger risks for Biden because the race is so stable. So if for some reason there is uh, something that happens tonight uh, that shakes that up or shakes people's confidence in Biden's ability to do the job, that would really be a problem for him. And I think they know that. Uh, and I think we also have come to, to know President Trump, and I don't think anyone is right. going to be surprised or shocked by what he uh, delivers tonight. And that is, by the way, different than 2016, yep, back yes. when there were a lot of Americans who maybe they were paying attention to the Republican primary as a sideshow, 
But really, their first experience of Donald Trump as a possible actual president was in those debates against Hillary Clinton. That's just not the case anymore. So, Joshua, and this is all purely speculative, but if Donald Trump has a poor debate performance tonight, what's the likelihood he shows up for the other two? I think it's probably about 100 percent with zero rounding error. Because if there's one thing we know about Donald Trump from his entire life, his business career, the provenance of which is now under question after the reporting from The New York Times, it's that he will not admit defeat. He does not admit loss. He doesn't back True. down. He's a student he of Roy Cohn. Take his ball and go his home. thing is that when you get hit, hit 10 times harder, deny, deny, deny. I do not buy the idea that he won't show up because it'd be too easy for the Biden campaign to show. See? See, we told you. Mm -hmm. We told you the minute that you hit him, that whole paper tiger falls right, right apart. Didn't even burn, just blew away a pile of ashes, not even paper. See, this is exactly who Donald Trump really was. I don't believe that he personally will yeah. let the Biden campaign hold that over him. Now, you, you may be right. I hear what you're saying, that he may try yeah. to take his ball and go home and say, ah, I knew the debates were rigged. I knew it was, <laughs> was flimsy. I knew it was phony. Right. But I, 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 I've read too much... Shakespeare and too many Greek tragedies to not believe in hubris. I just don't buy necessarily <laughs> that he's willing to say, I, okay, I got, we'll I got whipped. I, I, I think the risk, especially, you know, yeah. especially looking at the guest list, you mentioned the UFC fighter, Colby Covington. Right. Colby yeah. Covington just got in trouble for saying some very racially insensitive things about he someone sure who just fought uh, right. in the yeah. ring. Uh, really? Including this saying happened that the at a USC match? I'm shocked. Uh, well, yeah, yes. But it, I just don't, I think the people that he's surrounding himself with tonight, the messaging yeah. he's had so far, even saying that the debates are rigged. In the news conferences last week, he was saying, oh, I'm not really preparing for the debate. I prepare all the time. I do my job. Right. That's my preparation for the debates. The idea is he can walk in, sweep the floor with Joe Biden, and walk away. I may be wrong, but nothing okay. in his character suggests that he's okay conceding defeat on any level. Oh, I never said he'd concede defeat. He just would come up with a new way of saying, I'm going to hold my own debates, or I'm going to hold my own thing, or I'm going to do my... Right. I, He'd here's say the thing. Biden cheated. Why should I show yeah. up? We'll because see. then Biden gets He's, the stage to himself. Biden gets the as, entire as, stage on every major broadcast right. network to himself. I don't think Donald yeah. Trump's going to let him have it. No, look, at the end of the day, it's Donald Trump. So all of us are going to find out in real time. Uh, Casey, Joshua, and Michael, you guys stick around. I'm going to sneak a break in here. Up ahead, we're going to hear from some swing voters in tonight's debate uh, in the great state of Ohio about what they're hoping to hear tonight. But first, all this hour, we're also going to share some memorable moments from first presidential debates in years past. Emphasizing the word first. Let's go back to 2012 and this moment with Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, and moderator Jim Lehrer. Jim, the, pre the president began this segment, so I think I get the last word. So well, I'm going to take. You're going to get the first right. word in the next segment. <laughs> well, but but he gets the first word of that segment. I get the last word of that segment. I hope. Let me just make this comment. <laughs> I he This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. 
What am I gonna decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we could just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infections. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Welcome back. While we might get 100 million viewers for tonight's debate, the number of undecided voters watching tonight will be a lot smaller than 100 million. We don't even know if there's a million of them these days. Polling shows that most voters' minds are already made up heading into tonight's first debate. But we swear there are a handful of undecideds out there. Our polling says there is at least 10 percent of them. Our MSNBC senior national correspondent Chris Jancy sat down with a couple of them, swing voters in suburban Cleveland, near the site of tonight's debate, near where... Chris, where you grew up, I know. Find out what they'll be watching for. These are yeah. in Ohio. They know what it's like to be courted as a swing voter. And uh, we didn't think they were going to be swing voters when this year started, but they are right now. In fact, Chuck, I told my family at the beginning of the year, don't expect me to be coming around very much during the election <laughs> year because Ohio's not a swing state anymore. Uh, t tells you uh, what my prognostication skills are. Look, there's a reason that this has always been so important. There is no state, bragging a little bit, that has predicted more accurately the presidential winner. 1964, since then, always Ohio went with the winner. Mm -hmm. Having said that, as I look at this year, I thought, okay, this is gonna be very much issues oriented for what I think 7% is what the polls now show of the people who are undecided here. Because the unemployment rate is higher than the national average. Coronavirus hospitalizations are on the way up. And yet when I talk to undecided voters, the word that keeps coming up, Chuck, over and over and over again is character. Here's part of my conversation with those voters. I historically side Republican. This year, I feel particularly just undecided because of the personalities. Trump turned you off. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you still might vote for him because of the policies. I might. What's going to make the difference in the debate? I would like to see if the president can tone down the rhetoric, if it's less about him and more about the questions. And in both cases, um, I'd like to see if they could answer the question and be civil. Can Trump be civil? Can Biden put together a comprehensive thought, but I don't think there's any one specific issue or, you know, policy that I'm, I'm looking to get an answer to it. I want to see how Joe is able to handle himself under the fire that he's going to get from uh, the president. Are you nervous for him? I have some concerns. We talked to a lot more voters on the phone, and one of the things that's really resonating that Trump has said, Chuck, along with his supporters, is Joe Biden's age. The other yeah. thing, Hunter Biden, watch for that tonight. We're actually in this beautiful backyard because those folks are going to come back here. We're going to watch the debate along with them. We'll see if their minds are changed or if they're swayed one way or another, Chuck. Fascinating how much the issue of, of Biden's mental acuity has made its way into those yep. comments that you have there. It says a lot about the power of the president's I hear messaging it from of late. Everyone. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Chris Jansing, thank you. With me now are two men who know a thing or two about preparing a candidate for a debate. John Podesta, chair of Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, founder of the Center for American Progress, and Lonnie Chet, policy director for Mitt Romney's 2012 presidential campaign and now a fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. John Podesta, I hope you just heard that last segment because to me it's sort of an interesting little issue that the Biden campaign has. I think it's a strength, perhaps. 
Um, but I'm curious, this, this lingering issue, it's certainly had a huge assist from Fox News primetime and some of the conservative media echo chamber, but the president has been on this idea that Joe Biden can't put a sentence together. Going into a first debate, is this, could Biden have asked for a, a better bar to clear with that voter that we just spoke with? I don't think so, actually, Chuck. I think he needs to, he really needs to get his positive message out, not get sucked in by uh, Donald Trump's, who I think has to change the dynamic of this race, will be on the attack from the get-go. Uh, you know, he has a formula, I'm great, you suck. Uh, you know, <laughs> here's the uh, reason why, you, you know, you're, you're going to be terrible for the American people. I think what Biden has to do is rather than get in a tit for tat, he just has to demonstrate that he's got a plan for the country, uh, that he delivers that with seriousness on, on COVID, on the economy, uh, and I think he'll do fine. John Podesta, do you think he's got to, though, take a couple of swings at Trump? I mean, there's one thing of ignoring most of the attacks, but can he afford to ignore them all? No, I, you know, look, I think he's got a critique of Trump that's very deep and that he will be able to to have plenty of opportunity. They're going to do 15 minutes on COVID-19. So I think that uh, he has plenty of hits that he can mm -hmm. deliver on Trump. I think what is a mis would be a mistake for him is to try to kind of get into this uh, crosstalk that Trump likes to get into. Right. He should just make sure that he knows exactly what that critique is. He pounds away at it. And if Trump, you know, gets really nasty, attacks his family, et cetera, I think he can square off and, you know, people are worried about his temper. I think there are moments where seeing your temper rise a little bit is actually helpful. Yeah, Michael Dukakis was criticized for not losing his temper, arguably. I was, um, I was, I was in a room and yeah. my heart sunk when I saw that <laughs> doing debate response. <laughs> the, the election was over at that point. <laughs> uh, Lonnie Chen, I, I, I hesitate to say, what should Donald Trump do tonight? Look, you've, you've had to prep more traditional candidates for president, for presidential debates. This is an untraditional. I guess if you could get into his head and reprogram him, what would you have an incumbent president do tonight who's down seven points with a raging virus if he were a sort of more traditional incumbent president struggling for reelection? Well, I mean, Chuck, you heard it from those undecided voters in Ohio. I would have him talk about what his plans are for the next four years. Uh, I'd have him talk about the economy. It's an issue uh, in all the polling we've seen recently, the NBC News poll from over mm -hmm. the weekend, other media outlets. The economy is a natural strength for the president, notwithstanding where things have been since the COVID-19 lockdown. So I would really have him think carefully about what are the various points on the economy you can emphasize, even looking back at the first term, the record, right? They can talk about what they've done with China. They can talk about uh, some of the, the manufacturing that's come back. They can talk about the regulatory relief and the tax relief. So there are elements of the president's record he can talk about, elements of the plan going forward he should emphasize. But that would be kind of untrue to who Donald Trump is, right? Donald mm -hmm. Trump is going to go out there and swing away, right. and there's not going to be a lot of discipline in the message. Is there all right? Let me ask the question then this way, Lonnie. Knowing who he is, and, and playing to what he can, what he is only comfortable doing. What would you advise this version of Donald Trump to do? Um, I'd advise him to keep the pressure on Biden. Look, I mean, there's no drawback to keeping the pressure on in a variety of areas, right? You want to attack mm -hmm. Biden. Uh, on his personal uh, issues with uh, with the Hunter Biden stuff. You want to attack him on having a light schedule. You want to attack him for being uh, maybe a step slower than he was in 2012 when, when I had to prepare Paul Ryan to debate him as vice president. So, you know, there's no drawback if you're Trump, I think, to keeping him on the defensive. And you never know what's going to happen. You might force right. an error. You might show that Biden's not really quite up to the challenge. There are lots of things that could come out of this. So if you're Trump, you keep the pressure on and see what happens. Let's talk about the tax return story. John Podesta, how much would you would you use it if you were Joe Biden tonight? Look, I think Chris Wallace will probably start there, probably start with the economy and, and start with the tax return. And I think the point that he needs to press is as president of the United States, he paid $750 in taxes in 2017. 
You know, that's what he thinks he owes the country when uh, people making $25,000 pay uh, twice as much in federal income tax. People make in the medium uh, income bracket uh, may pay 10 times as much as as he, he makes that he paid. I would stick with that. That's a very I think that's a very sticky number, uh, maybe yeah. even more than zero that, I, you know, that's what he thinks he owes uh, the American people, the frontline workers, the people who are fighting wars uh, overseas. That's his contribution to making America great, $750. And I think that says a lot about his character, a uh, lot about the way he does business. And, you know, I wouldn't, I, I think I'd uh, s spend my time on that rather than you know, right. all the shenanigans he has in, the t in his tax returns in the past John, that the New York John, Times has exposed. I agree with you about that, that 750 in some way is, is worse than zero. 750, because of what you said, it's a, it, is, it is a stickier number. Lonnie, what is a good defense of this? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you, know, I, I, you know, again, I'm putting you in the, in the you know, I, I think we know what Donald Trump will say. Oh, it's not true. Da, 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 da. Is there a defense of this? Well, I remember when uh, Mitt Romney got attacked for paying a 14% uh, effective yeah. tax rate, right? So how far the discussion has come since then. Yeah. I, I think the most effective strategy might actually be the one that's native to Trump. I went back and watched the first debate in 2016, and there were several answers where basically the premise was, uh, you're wrong, it's made up, it's all fake, and you know, here are other things I'd rather talk about. And there really isn't a great answer to this. I mean, he could say, look, I just took advantage of the laws that were out there. There's, right. I mean, this doesn't seem like a very effective defense. I think he's much better off doing what he naturally wants to do, which is attack and, and simply deflect. And it, it's, it's a bad news story. And there's not a whole lot else you can do right. with something like that, except for do what you're comfortable doing and not try to be somebody else. John Podesta, Lonnie Chen, I think you guys did a great job previewing tonight. I do think you both have given us uh, some insight on, on, on what, this, what this 90 minutes plus is going to look like tonight. Thank you both. Up ahead, Thanks, North Carolina can start officially processing votes today. And there's already a sign of trouble. We're going to go there and to Battleground Michigan next. But first, we go back to this classic debate moment in 2000 when Al Gore was on a roll and I roll. One minute. Man's practicing fuzzy math again. There's differences. a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story 
Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. Welcome back. As we head into tonight's debate, both candidates will be aiming their answers towards voters in battleground states, or they're supposed to be. But there are new signs of trouble for President Trump in the key places that he flipped in 2016, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Two recent polls show Biden leading in Pennsylvania. The latest NBC News Marist poll of Wisconsin shows Biden now leading there by 10 points. Trump holds the same level of support in our Michigan numbers. Uh, he's sitting there at 44, although Biden's numbers are slightly lower than that. He still holds an eight-point lead. Our own Dasha Burns is talking to voters in Kent County, Michigan, for our Kennedy County project about what they want to hear from the candidates tonight. So, Grand Rapids, what, what are you hearing, Dasha? Well, Chuck, there are a couple things that are different on this first presidential debate night in Michigan than they have been in the past. The biggest change is that a lot of voters in this state actually have their ballots in hand right now. They became available to voters last week. And so for the last couple of days, we've spent time with Kent County Democrat organizers and Kent County Republican organizers and volunteers as they have been using this time as a really critical period of time to engage with voters and do that outreach as much earlier than they would normally do it because people are going to be voting this week, Chuck. And the approaches are pretty different. One uh, difference is the Republicans, Trump won this county in 2016, albeit by a narrow margin, but their chair, Joel Freeman, tells me they are trying to replicate that essentially in 2020. They're trying to hold on to that enthusiasm. In 2016, they had a lot of first time voters come out for Trump. And he says they're coming back again. He actually told me that he doesn't see a huge difference between 2016 and 2020. Democrats, on the other hand, are trying to make the opposite thing happen this time around. And they're saying this election feels completely different from 2016. They're seeing a lot of brand new volunteers who have never been involved in yeah. politics before. In terms of what people actually want to hear, though, from these candidates, it's interesting, Chuck. It sounds like everyone wants to see their candidate be the best version of themselves, which means they want Trump to be Trump and Biden to be Biden. Take a listen to some of what I heard. I feel like one of the biggest things that really gets his base and just like, you know, the common voter riled up is just how he is him and he doesn't really have too much restraint. So just let Trump be Trump. What I want to hear is, is Vice President Biden remain away from the personal attacks, which I think we know Trump is going to lob, uh, remain committed to his focus on his vision, on his plan, on what sets him apart from a, a, another four years of, of President Trump. Chuck, that second voter you just heard from, that's Mitch Monin, and he is actually a Republican. He's voted Republican in every election of his life, except in 2016, when he went third party. We actually met him at the Kent County Democrats' office as he was picking up a Biden-Harris sign to put in his yard. And Chuck, I have to tell you, I have no stats, no great uh, numbers right. on this, but every time I've been to the Kent County Democrats' office, I have run into a Republican there. Uh, and Mitch is actually a, a veteran Army Ranger. He says mm -hmm. he's frustrated with how Trump has handled right. military issues, and he's uh, going to be interested to hear what they both have to say tonight. Chuck? Well, Dasha, that's why we're in Kent County. It's why it's one of our counties. And... If Biden is, has any plans on winning this election, he better hope more Republicans show up to the Democratic headquarters in Kent County. Anyway, Dasha Burns in Michigan for us. Dasha, thank you. Let me go south. Let's go to North Carolina. Election officials are now counting mail-in ballots. But data is showing that African-American voters are having their mail ballots rejected four times more frequently than white voters. Morgan Rafford is in North Carolina with more. And 
Morgan, this is the first two days of early voting. We saw it was immediately 4% rejection rate, 1% uh, among, among white voters. And the fact that it's still holding is pretty disturbing. That's right, Chuck. And this is kind of where they're beginning to count those mail-in ballots, because as you mentioned, today is the first day in North Carolina. North Carolina is one of the few states that begins to count those mail-in ballots before the election. This is the Mecklenburg County Board of Elections. So Mecklenburg County, for example, holds Charlotte here in North Carolina. And they're actually having a board meeting right now where they're receiving 35,000 ballots that they're going to go through tonight before they open their next batch next Tuesday. But this is the issue at hand, Chuck. You mentioned the fact that state statistics show that among those mail-in ballots, black voters are seeing their ballots rejected or returned for inconsistencies at four times the rate of white voters. And when we talk to the, the state board of elections, county board of elections, both in Monroe and Union County and here in Mecklenburg County, they all mm -hmm. can't give an answer as to why that discrepancy exists. But they say that the inconsistencies they're seeing that's causing them to send those ballot faxes back are things like this. For example, this is a mail-in ballot. You might not have a voter signature or you might not have the signature of a witness, which is required by law in North Carolina. We talked to one of those voters, a 70-year-old black man, who said that he didn't even know that his ballot had, in fact, been rejected until we called him. Take a listen to what he had to say. So you decided you were going to vote no matter what. If I had election. to crawl, if I had to crawl, I would have I gone. The data showing that black voters are having their mail-in ballots rejected at four times the rate of white voters here in North Carolina. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, it's funny how that works out. You know, you think after all this time it took us to get the vote, you would think that we would still be able, but we still seem to be fighting to vote in 2020. When we talk to nonpartisan election experts, they say the best explanation they can come up with right now for this discrepancy is perhaps the fact that a lot of African-American voters in North Carolina are typically used to voting early and in person. So yeah. many of them are voting for the first time via mail-in ballot, and they think that could be the mistake. But the reality of it is uh, state board of election officials, they, they are upset that there are these calls, uh, that th this racial discrepancy exists. Sure. But the reality of it is those numbers do exist and that impact is real for the people that we have spoken to. Chuck? Well, it's important that in some ways, the fact that we're finding it before Election Day, North Carolina does give folks a chance to fix their ballot. Isn't that correct, Morgan? That is correct. That's correct. So it's called a voter yeah. curing process. And New York right. is, I mean, excuse me, North Carolina is one of the states that allows people to correct their ballots. But of course, right. they have to be notified by their right. county board that there was, in fact, a mistake. And they have to be able to correct it before the election, Chuck. And it turns out sometimes we have to do the notifying. Uh, and it probably wasn't intended for us <laughs> to be the notifiers. Anyway, Morgan Radford <laughs> on the ground for us in North it. Carolina. Thank you, Morgan. And I'm sure that voter thanks you now, too. Uh, our panel is back right after the break with what they'll be looking uh, looking for when President Trump and Joe Biden face off in just a few minutes. But first, this debate moment from 2004 when John Kerry took George W. Bush to task over his response to the war on terror. In answer to your question about Iraq and sending people into Iraq, he just said, the enemy attacked us. Saddam Hussein didn't attack us. Osama bin Laden attacked us. Al-Qaeda attacked us. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. 
you got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. You know what? He's been doing it for 47 years. I've been doing it for three and a half years, so he should be able to beat me, I would think. He's much more experienced. They'll give him a big shot of something, and he'll go out there. He'll have a lot of energy. He'll have energy. He'll be like a Superman for about 15 minutes. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to go to the debate. Steve's just asking, will I go on the attack? Uh, I have no idea. I think this whole thing, though, is debate prep. You know, what I do is debate prep every day. I'm taking questions from you people all the time. Welcome back to NBC's special coverage of the 2020 presidential debates as we are now just a few minutes away from the start of the first of three scheduled showdowns. That was the sound of how President Trump has been gearing up for tonight. Here is Joe Biden. I can hardly wait to deal with what he refers to himself as a stable genius. I think everybody knows this man is, uh, has a somewhat pathological tendency not to tell the truth. I've begun to prepare by, uh, by uh, going over what the president has said and the multiple lies he's, <laughs> he's told. He's a fool. Thank you. The comments are just foolish. Get ready, Mr. President. Here I come. And I'm used to dealing with bullies. The point is that, uh, Rather than say how I'm going to do, again, watch me. Casey Hunt, Joshua Johnson, and Michael Beschloss are back to wrap things up. Michael, I'll start with you. I think we uh, got shorted uh, in the last segment there with you. So take it from the Joe Biden and the challenger perspective here. Um, we haven't had a challenger this far ahead against an incumbent president since Bill Clinton, though, we, the Ross right. Perot thing sort of was part of it. And then I guess before right. that, you'd have to go back to Jimmy Carter. Um, right. What what do you expect to be seeing from Joe Biden tonight? Uh, I expect Joe Biden basically to treat Donald Trump like a child who's having a tantrum that he can't do very much about and let people choose between these two figures. We're in a real crisis tonight. We're in a crisis of democracy. We're in a crisis of a pandemic that has taken 200,000 lives. The Trump people are so worried about that that it, they reportedly asked the moderator, Chris Wallace, not to mention that. Our economy is also in very bad shape. Do people watching this tonight think that they have the luxury of choosing a next president who is not up to doing this job? The other thing, Chuck, is, you know, we will see things tonight probably that we have never seen before, but historically, incumbent presidents usually lose a first debate. 
That right. was true of, of Carter, Reagan, the two Bushes, even Obama, who was known for being this great orator. So the odds are probably against Donald Trump being able to use this up to his own advantage. You know, Casey Hunt, the, I have to say, I one of the developments that I'm most surprised about is that there is no new virus relief, and we're at the first presidential debate. It's not to say it might not happen before Election Day, um, and I know this is your beat. Um, it's still stunning to me we are entering tonight with an unknown about whether the federal government is going to help uh, bail a lot of people out on this virus. Unknown, and we're just uh, a day or so, two days away from uh, thousands of airline workers losing the help that's kept them afloat. Walt Disney Company just announced they're laying off 28,000 people because we have failed to grapple with this virus. I mean, the numbers are just stunning, and people are really hurting. And it is pretty stunning that we have let this kind of fall to the back burner. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and that is ultimately Congress's responsibility. I mean, they have failed to keep it on the front burner. I do think the talks today seem to be more advanced, uh, or at least trending in a direction that is more positive. Uh, and I think that surprised a lot of us who, you know, have been reporting on this all the way along, right. that both sides are basically still a trillion dollars apart from each other. But I think that reflects the fact that, you know, Democrats are coming under a lot of pressure to get something done here. Obviously, President Trump is running for re-election. Uh, but, but again, the closer we get to Election Day, the harder it is for either side to make a deal with the other. I mean, I think the other question here is, is the economy really hurting so badly that there is absolutely no alternative? Right. I think we may be headed in that direction, Chuck. Joshua Johnson, this has been the part of the, that I've just been head-scratching about, is how this is being left in the air. And I, I think that this is the issue that both candidates will get punished on if they're not talking about virus relief economic relief and relief on the health care front, if they're not focused on it, because I think a lot of people actually are tuning in for some answers on this. Absolutely. I think that COVID-19 is the issue that, you know, should dominate significantly the policy parts of this debate, because it crosses over into so many other things. I mean, the economy is listed as a separate issue from COVID-19. As you just heard from Casey, it's all locked together. I mean, regarding those 28,000 Disney layoffs, the company says the reason it's laying those people off is because it doesn't have guidance on COVID-19. One other issue I'm interested in hearing in particular is the section called race and violence in our cities and the way that that will be depicted. Obviously, there's concern about violence that's been peripheral to Black Lives Matter protests. It's worth noting that in the early Black Lives Matter protests about Michael Brown's killing in Ferguson, Missouri, You're no longer participating in protected First Amendment protests. So the framing of that is going to be interesting in terms of whether or not the candidates have a plan to deal with that and whether or not these two old, wealthy white men are able to speak to a growingly diverse, youthful nation about the future of race and equity and diversity. That's one thing that I think Joe Biden might be able to excel at in this debate, is that he projects empathy very well. And if the president doubles down on being puerile and insulting and harsh, Joe Biden might just be well served to let that pass and then look directly in the eyes of the American people and say, hey, forget about all that. I see you. I see what's going on. And here's what's happening tonight. That might change the calculus for who we consider the winner of the debate. But with Donald Trump in the White House, I think the calculus for who wins and loses these days is kind of changing every yeah. day. It, it, it does seem to. And I, I do think it's a good point. I mean, certainly that empathy uh, is what Joe Biden has been selling to the American people. Michael Beschloss, we're, we're running short on time here. I want to give you the last word in terms of the sweep and history of this. You mentioned we are facing an unprecedented crisis. What's on the line tonight for our country? not come up with a national plan to deal with it. People are suffering in this economy in a way that is different from any time ever before. And the other thing, if I might say, Casey, I don't know whose idea it was to put the words race and violence in the cities in the same sentence as an issue to be discussed tonight, but I think that never should have been allowed because those are two subjects that should not be linked, and it's almost making an editorial comment in itself. 
No, I think that's that's a fair point, and certainly there was some some criticism uh, of that. I mean, the the reality here is that race uh, has been something that we as a nation uh, have been grappling with in right. such uh, you know from the very founding documents of our country. Right. So. Uh, I do think that it's that it's a very good, uh, very good point. I mean, so much on the line here. I, I was just reading uh, through Michael Beschler, uh, through uh, the Atlantic story uh, today about what could be on the line here uh, tonight in terms of how this election ultimately ends. Joshua Johnson, Michael Beschloss, thank you both so much. Thanks so much for being with us this hour. NBC News coverage of the first 2020 presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden continues. From NBC right now. News, the presidential debate. Here are Lester Holt and Savannah Guthrie. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first 2020 presidential debate. Donald Trump and Joe Biden face to face with Election Day just 35 days away and voting already underway by mail or in person in 30 states. And the stage is set. It's in Cleveland, Ohio tonight. The co host, Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. The moderator is Fox News anchor Chris Wallace. And the stakes, well, they're high. The presidency and the future direction of the country on the line tonight, Lester. There's a lot of ground to cover, Savannah, over the next 90 minutes. The candidates' records, including President Trump's tax returns, the Supreme Court vacancy, the pandemic, the economy, racism and civil unrest, and the integrity of the election itself. We may need a little longer than an hour and a half, but the debate commission has set the rules, has determined, by the way, that the moderator is not responsible for fact-checking the candidates tonight. But our team is standing by to do just that and to offer expert insight and analysis. And for live fact-checking during the debate, you can go to NBCNews.com. So let's get started. We'll go first to Chief White House Correspondent Hallie Jackson, who is inside the debate hall. Hallie, what are you hearing from both camps? A couple of things, Ivana. You have two very different candidates and two very different kinds of debate prep that has been happening. Sources close to President Trump, for example, say he's really been doing more informal Q&As with his top advisors. On the Biden side, people familiar with his planning say the focus this week has gotten more intense as he has done issue by issue practice sessions, essentially. When you talk about topics, watch for President Trump to try to turn this race into less of a referendum and more of a choice. He will likely go on attack, probably, according to aides who have been and previewing this by getting personal with Joe Biden, potentially going after his son, Hunter Biden. On the other side, Joe Biden will focus on the pandemic. He wants to keep the focus on that. And you won't see a lot of live fact checking from him unless something is particularly egregious, Savannah. All right. Also with us is NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd. Chuck, what will you be watching for this evening? Well, I'll tell you, it's an unusual situation when the front runner is the challenger and the person that has to upend the race is actually the incumbent, and that's Donald Trump here. I'm curious to see, does President Trump, he's been telegraphing that he's going to get personal and, and basically do whatever it takes to shake up Joe Biden, but does he actually tell voters what he wants to do for a second term? It's something he hasn't done. For Joe Biden, his, it, it's obvious. Does, is he able to parry away by, uh, Trump's attacks without chasing them down rabbit holes. We're about 30 seconds away. Senior Washington correspondent Andrea Mitchell is there. The moderator is in place. This race has been remarkably stable, but a debate always has the opportunity to upend things, Andrea. Absolutely. And Donald Trump goes into this debate uh, farther behind in national polls than any incumbent since George Herbert Walker Bush in 92 against Bill Clinton. But that was a three-way race with Ross Perot. Still, he's got a lot to prove, but I would not bet on uh, any conventional wisdom tonight. He is a performer. And, of course, we have to see how he performs tonight. All right, Andrea, thanks. And with the debate about to begin, we want to go to Cleveland and moderator Chris Wallace. Here he is. Good evening from the health education campus of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. I'm Chris Wallace of Fox News, and I welcome you to the first of the 2020 presidential debates between President Donald J. Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. This debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The Commission has designed the format, six roughly 15-minute segments, with two-minute answers from each candidate to the first question, then open discussion for the rest of each segment. 
Both campaigns have agreed to these rules. For the record, I decided the topics and the questions in each topic. I can assure you, none of the questions has been shared with the Commission or the two candidates. This debate is being conducted under health and safety protocols designed by the Cleveland Clinic, which is serving as the health security advisor to the Commission for all four debates. As a precaution, both campaigns have agreed the candidates will not shake hands at the beginning of tonight's debate. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, no boos or other interruptions, so we, and more importantly you, can focus on what the candidates have to say. No noise except right now, as we welcome the Republican nominee, President Trump, and the Democratic nominee, Vice President Biden. Gentlemen, a lot of people have been waiting for this night, so let's get going. Our first subject is the Supreme Court. President Trump, you nominated Amy Coney Barrett over the weekend to succeed the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the court. You say the Constitution is clear about your obligation and the Senate's to consider a nominee to the court. Vice President Biden, you say that this is an effort by the President and Republicans to jam through an appointment and what you call an abuse of power. My first question to both of you tonight, why are you right in the argument you make and your opponent wrong, and where do you think a Justice Barrett would take the court? President Trump, in this first segment, you go first, two minutes. Thank you very much, Chris. I will tell you very simply, we won the election. Elections have consequences. We have the Senate, we have the White House, and we have a phenomenal nominee, respected by all, top, top academic, uh, good in every way, good in every way. In fact, uh, some of her biggest endorsers are very liberal people from Notre Dame and other places. So I think she's going to be fantastic. We have plenty of time. Uh, even if we did it after the election itself. I have a lot of time after the election, as you know. So I think that uh, she will be outstanding. She's going to be uh, as good as anybody that has served on that court. We really feel that. Uh, we have a professor at Notre Dame, highly respected by all, said she's the single greatest student he's ever had. He's been a professor for a long time at a great school. And uh, we just, uh, we won the election, and therefore we have the right to choose her, and very few people knowingly would say otherwise. And by the way, the Democrats, they wouldn't even think about not doing it. If they had, the only difference is to try and do it faster. There's no way they would give it up. They had Merritt Garland, but the problem is they didn't have the election, so they were stopped. And probably that would happen in reverse also. Definitely would happen in reverse. So we won the election, and we have the right to do it, Chris. President Trump, thank you. Um same question to you, Vice President Biden. You have two minutes. Well, first of all, um, thank you for doing this and looking thank forward you. to this, Mr. President. Thank you, Joe. I, uh, the American people have a right to have a say in who the Supreme Court nominee is. And that say occurs when they vote for a United States senator and when they vote for the President of the United States. They're not going to get that chance now because we're in the middle of an election already. The election has already started. Tens of thousands of people have already voted. And so the thing that should happen is we should wait. We should wait and see what the outcome of this election is, because that's the only way the American people get to express their view is by who they elect as president and who they elect as vice president. Now, what's at stake here is the president's made it clear he wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. He's been running on that, he ran on that, and he has been governing on that. He's in the Supreme Court right now trying to get rid of uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, will strip 20 million people from having insurance, health insurance now, if it, if they, if it goes into court. And, and uh, the justice, and I have nothing, I'm not opposed to the justice, but she seems like a very fine person. But she's written before she went in the bench, which is her right, that she thinks that the Affordable Care Act is not constitutional. 
The other thing that's on the court, and if, and if it's struck down, what happens? Women's rights are fundamentally changed. Once again, a woman could be held, pay more money because she has a pre-existing condition of pregnancy. We were able to, they were able to charge a woman more for the same exact procedure a man did, gets. And that ended when we, in fact, passed the Affordable Care Act. And there's 100 million people who have pre-existing conditions, and they'll be taken away as well. Those pre-existing conditions, the insurance companies are going to love this. And so it's just not appropriate to do this before this election. If he wins the election and the Senate is Democrat or Republican, then it, he goes forward. If not, we should wait until February. All right. There aren't 100 million people with pre-existing conditions. As far as the say is concerned, the people already had their say. They — okay, Justice Ginsburg said very powerfully, very strongly, at some point, 10 years ago or so, she said a president and the Senate is elected for a period of time. But a president's elected for four years. We're not elected for three years. I'm not elected for three years. So we have the Senate. We have a president. He's elected to the next During election. that period of time, during that period of time, we have an opening. I'm not elected for three years. I'm elected for four years. The and the 100 million started. people, Joe, the 100 million people is totally wrong. I don't know where you got that number. The bigger problem that you have is that you're going to extinguish 180 million people with their private health care, that they're very That's happy That's simply with. not true. Well, you're certainly no, going that, to socialist. You're going to this, socialist this, this is, we're, we're now into, gentlemen, we're now into open discussion. Open discussion. Open discussion. Yes, I agree. Go ahead, Vice President. Number Biden. one, uh, he, he knows that uh, what I proposed. What I proposed is that uh, we expand Obamacare and we increase it. We do not wipe any. And one of the big debates we had with 23 of my colleagues trying to win the nomination that I won, we're saying that Biden wanted to allow people to have private insurance still. They can. They do. They will, under my proposal. It's not what you've said, but and it's not what your party is, has said. That is simply Your party a lie. doesn't say it. Your party wants simple. to go socialist my medicine party is and me. socialist right health care. Right now, I am the And they're the going to dominate party. you, Joe. You know that. I am the Democratic Party right now. The platform of the Democratic Party Harris. is what I, in fact, approved of. What I approved of. Now, here's the deal. The deal is that it's going to wipe out pre-existing conditions. And by the way, the 20, the 200 million, the 200,000 people that have died on his watch, how many of those have survived? Well, there's 7 million people that contracted COVID. What does it mean for them going forward if you strike down the Affordable Care Act? And Joe, you've had 308,000 military people dying because you couldn't provide them proper health care in the military. So don't tell me I'm about this. I'm happy to talk about this. And if you were here, you, Look, it wouldn't be deal. 200. It would be 2 million people because you were very late on the draw. You late didn't want me draw. to ban China, which was heavily infected. You didn't want me to ban All right, we're, gentlemen, Europe, we're, we're, which no, was heavily infected. You would have been President, much later, Joe. Mr. President. Much later. Mr. President. You're talking about 2 million people. You're not the president, as a moderator, <laughs> we are going to talk about COVID in the next segment, but well, go ahead. Let me finish. The point is that the president also is opposed to Roe v. Wade. That's on the ballot as well in the court, in the court. And so that's also at stake right now. And so the election is all You don't know it's begun. on the ballot. I, Why is it on the ballot? Because, because Why is it on the ballot? It's not on the ballot. It's on the ballot in the I court. I don't think so. In the court. Well, There's nothing happening there. Donald, would you and just And you don't know her me? view on Roe v. Wade. You I don't, don't know, know her view. Well, all right. Let's, all right. Let's talk. I would, we got a lot to unpack here, gentlemen. We got a lot of time. So <laughs> uh, on health care, and then we'll come back to Roe v. Wade. All right. Mr. President, the, the Supreme Court will hear a case a week after the election in which the Trump administration, along with 18 state attorneys general, are seeking to overturn That's right. Obamacare, to end Obamacare. You have spent the last— Because they want to give I, good health care. If I may ask right. my question, sir. Good health care. Over uh, the last four years, you have promised to repeal and replace Obamacare, but you have never in these four years come up with a plan a comprehensive plan yes, to I replace have. Obamacare. Of course I have. 
Well, I'll I give got you rid an, of the I'm individual gonna, finish, mandate. I'm give you Excuse an me. I got I, rid of the individual mandate, which was a big is not chunk a of Obama. Plan. That is absolutely a big thing. That was that, the worst I, I part of Obamacare, sir. Chris, that was the worst part me. of Obamacare. Let me ask my question. Well, I'll, I'll ask Joe. I, 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 the individual no, mandate I, was the most unpopular Vice, aspect of Obamacare. President, I got rid of it, I'd like and we will protect people. Mr. President, I'm the moderator of this debate, and I would like you to let me ask my question, and then you can answer your question. You, in the course of these four years, have never come up with a comprehensive plan to replace Obamacare. And just this last Thursday, you signed a largely symbolic executive order That's to protect symbolic. people with pre-existing conditions five days before this debate. So my question, sir, is what is the Trump health care plan? Right. Well, first of all, I guess I'm debating you, not him, but that's okay. I'm not surprised. Let me just tell you something, that <laughs> there's nothing symbolic. I'm cutting drug prices. I'm going with favored nations, which no president has the courage to do because you're going against big pharma. Drug prices will be coming down 80 or 90 percent. You could have done it during your 47-year period in government, but you didn't do it. <laughs> Nobody's done it. So we're cutting health care. All of the things condition? that we've done, insulin. I give you an example. Insulin. It's going to. It was destroying families, destroying people. The cost. I'm getting it for so cheap. It's like water, you want to know the truth. So cheap. Take a look at all of the drugs that what we're doing, prescription drug prices. We're going to allow our governors now to go to other countries to buy drugs okay. because when they fact, pay just a I, tiny fraction. As I say, this is open do. discussion. No, let but me this ask is you big, about, let me, this you'll is be happy, big stuff. Sir, you'll be happy, I'm about to pick up on one of your points, to ask the vice president, which is he points out that you would like to add a public option to Obamacare, and yes. the argument that he makes, and other Republicans make, is that that is going to end private insurance. It is and not. Well, if I'm I sorry. ask you the question, it will not end. What your party says, by the way. It will end private insurance and create a government takeover of health care. It does not. It's that. only for those people who are so poor they qualify for Medicaid. They can get that free in most states, except governors who want to deny people who are poor Medicaid. Anyone who qualifies for Medicare would, excuse me, Medicaid would automatically be enrolled in the public option. The vast majority of the American people would still not be in that option, number one. Joe, you agreed two, with Bernie number, Sanders, I, I far did. left, on the manifesto, when, when we you, call it, and that gives you socialized medicine. Look, hey, Are I, you I'm not going to listen to him. The fact of the matter is, I beat Bernie Sanders. Not by I'm, much. I, I beat him a whole hell of a lot. I'm here, I'm here standing facing Pocahontas you all, Pocahontas would have left well, two days early. You would have lost every primary All he knows how to do Super is hurt. Tuesday. You got Look, very lucky. here's the deal. I got very lucky. I'm going to get very lucky tonight as well. And tonight I'm going With to make what? sure because here's the deal. Here's the deal. The fact is that everything he's saying so far is simply a lie. I'm not here to call out his lies. Everybody knows he's a liar. But you I just agree. want to make you're sure. Joe, you're the liar. I, 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 I want to make sure. You graduated last in your class, not first in your class. I, I, I want to make Mr. sure. Mr. President, can you let him finish, sir? No, he doesn't know how to do that. He has, You'd be you know, surprised. You, you picked You'd be surprised. the Go wrong ahead, guy, the wrong oh, night oh. at the wrong time. Listen, you agreed with Here's Bernie Sanders to the manifesto. The whole idea. Let, let, let him disavowing. There oh. is no manifesto, number Please one. Please let him speak, Mr. Number President. two. You just lost the left. Number two. I, 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 you just lost the left. You agreed with Bernie Sanders on a plan. How, uh, folks, this, absolutely folks, agreed to. Folks, do you have any idea what this is doing? They call it Mr. Mr. Do you have any do? Socialized medicine. Mr. President. Well, I'll tell you what. He is not for any help for people needing health care. Because, because he, in fact, already has cost 10 million people their health care that they had from their employers because of his recession. Number one. Number oh, two, oh, yeah, yeah. there are 20 million people getting health care through Obamacare now, that he wants to take it away. He won't ever look you in the eye and say that's what he wants to do. Take it away. No, I want to give him better health care at a much lower price but, because Obamacare is no he doesn't know how. He doesn't know how to do that. I've already fixed it. He has never I've offered a plan. fixed it to an extent. He has Obamacare, never done a single thing. Obamacare, as you might thing. know, but probably don't. No, Obamacare is no Gentlemen, you realize if you're both speaking at the same time. And it's too expensive. Let the president's Go ahead, sir. Obamacare is no good. We made it better. And I had a choice to make very early in. We took away the individual mandate. We guarantee pre-existing conditions, but took away the individual mandate. Listen, this is the way it is. <laughs> and that destroyed that they shouldn't even call it Obamacare. Then I had a choice to make. Do I let my people run it really well? 
or badly. Yeah. If I run it badly, they'll probably blame him, but they'll blame me. But more importantly, I want to help people, okay? I said, you got to run it so well. That's what and I for. just had a meeting with them. They said, the problem is no matter how well you run Obamacare, it's a disaster. It's too expensive, okay. premiums are too it. high, that's and it doesn't work. That's so we, we, we do no, want to no, get no. rid of it. I, we, well, Chris, we want to get rid of it. I understand it, sir, but I have to, I have to give you roughly good. equal time. Good. Please let the vice president talk. Good. He has no plan for health care. Of course he we do. Sends, Please. He sends out wishful thinking. He has executive orders that have no power. He hasn't lowered drug costs for anybody. He's been promising a health care plan since he got elected. He has none, like almost everything else he talks about. He does not have a plan. He doesn't have a plan. And the fact is, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. All right. He's I, have one, I have one final question for you, sure. uh, Mr. Vice President. If Senate Republicans, we were talking originally about the Supreme Court here, if Senate Republicans go ahead and confirm Justice Barrett, uh, there has been talk about ending the filibuster or even packing the court, adding to the nine justices there. You call this a distraction by the president, but in fact, it wasn't brought up by the president. It was brought up by some of your Democratic colleagues in, well, the, saying, in the Congress. So my question to you is, you have refused in the past to talk about it. Are you willing to tell the American people tonight whether or not you will support either ending the filibuster or packing the court? Whatever position I take in that, that'll become the issue. The issue is the American people should speak. You should go out and vote. You're in voting now. Vote and let your senators know how you strongly you feel. Let, vote now. Are you going to pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people know he doesn't want you're to senators. The question. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you answer that because question? the you question want to put is a lot of the new question Supreme is Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut who is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This who is, is on your so list, right. gentlemen. Is, I think this we've is ended so this. He's going to pack the court. We have ended. not going to give a list. We have ended this segment. We're going to move on to the second segment. That was really a productive segment, wasn't it? <laughs> Keep yapping, man. The people understand, Joe. <laughs> they sure 47 do. years, you've Je done nothing. They understand. Oh. All right. The second subject <laughs> is COVID-19, which is an awfully serious subject. So let's try to be serious about it. We have had more than 7 million cases of coronavirus in the United States, and more than 200,000 people have died. Even after we produce a vaccine. Experts say that it could be months or even years before we come back to anything approaching normal. My question for both of you is, based on what you have said and done so far and what you have said you would do starting in 2021, why should the American people trust you more than your opponent to deal with this public health crisis going forward? In this case, the question goes to you first, sir. Two minutes uninterrupted. Good luck. 200,000 dead. As you said, over 7 million infected in the United States. We, in fact, have 5%, 4% of the world's population, 20% of the deaths. 40,000 people a day are contracting COVID. In addition to that, about between 750 and 1,000 people a day are dying. When he was presented with that number, he said it is what it is. Well, it is what it is because you are who you are. That's why it is. The president has no plan. He hasn't laid out anything. He knew all the way back in February how serious this crisis was. He knew it was a deadly disease. What did he do? He's on tape is acknowledging he knew it. He said he didn't tell us or give people a warning of it because he didn't want to panic the American people. You don't panic. He panicked. In addition to that, what did he do? He went in and he, we were insisting that the Chinese, the, the people we had on the ground in China should be able to go to Wuhan and determine for themselves how dangerous this was. He did not even ask Xi to do that. He told us what a great job Xi was doing. He said we owe him a debt of gratitude for being so transparent with us. And what did he do then? He then did nothing. He, he waited and waited and waited. He still doesn't have a plan. Well, I laid yeah, out sir, back in March exactly so, so what wrong. we should be doing. And I laid out again in July what we should be doing. We should be providing all the 
protective gear possible. We should be providing the money the House has passed in order to be able to go out and get people the help they need to keep their businesses open. Open schools that cost a lot of money. You should get out of your bunker and get out of the sand trap and get in, in your golf course and go in the Oval Office and bring together the Democrats and Republicans and fund what needs to be done now to save lives. So if wait, we wait, would have listened wait, wait, to you— you have two minutes, sir. If we would have listened to you, the country would have been left wide open. Millions of people would have died, not 200,000, and one person is too much. It's China's fault. It should have never happened. They stopped it from going in, but it was China's fault. And by the way, when you talk about numbers, you don't know how many people died in China. You don't know how many people died in Russia. You don't know how many people died in India. They don't exactly give you a straight count, just so you understand. But if you look at what we've done, I closed it, and you said he's xenophobic, he's a racist, and he's xenophobic, because you it's didn't think I should have closed our country. Wait, no, Wait a minute. It says two minutes. You didn't think we should have closed our country because you thought it was too — it was terrible. You wouldn't have closed it for another two months. By my doing it early — in fact, Dr. Fauci said, President Trump saved thousands of lives. Many of you, a Democrat governor, said, President Trump did a phenomenal job. We worked with the governor. Oh, really? Go take a look. The governor said I did a phenomenal job. Most of them said that. In fact, people that would not be necessarily on my side said that. President Trump did a phenomenal job. We did. We got the gowns. We got the masks. We made the ventilators. You wouldn't have made ventilators. And now we're weeks away from a vaccine. We're doing therapeutics already. Fewer people are dying when they get sick. Far fewer people are dying. We've done a great job. The only thing I haven't done a good job, and that's because of the fake news, no matter what you say to them, they give you bad press on it. It's just fake news. They give you good press. They give me bad press, because that's the way it is, unfortunately. But let me just tell you something. I don't care. I've gotten used to it. But I'll tell you, Joe, you could never have done the job that we did. You don't have it in your blood. You could have never done that job. I know how to do the job. I know how to get the job Well, you done. didn't do very well in swine flu. H1N1, you were a disaster. Your own chief 14, of staff said 000, you were a disaster. 14,000 people died, not 200,000. There was a no very economic very, recession. Like, like, sir, you made a, a right now, less There was no recession. Disease, you made a point. Let him answer it. And there was no one, there was no, we didn't shut down the economy. This is his economy that's being, he shut down. The reason it's shut down is because, look, you folks at home, how many of you got up this morning and had an empty chair at the kitchen table because someone died of COVID? How many of you were in a situation where you lost your mom or dad and you couldn't even speak to them? You had a nurse holding a phone up so you could, in fact, say goodbye. You would have lost far How more many people. people. Far that more is, people. And, you would have been And by the way, your own, you his, 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 own, his own CDC director says we could lose as many as another 200,000 people between now and the end of the year. And he held up, he said, if we just wear a mask, we can save half those numbers. Just, just a mask. And by the way, in terms of the, the whole notion of a vaccine, we're for a vaccine, but we, I don't trust him at all, nor do you. I know you don't. What we trust is a scientist. You don't we trust, trust Dr. Johnson Fauci. And Johnson, Pfizer. We, 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 and okay, by the way, gentlemen, and gentlemen that, let, me, let me move on to questions about the future, because you both have touched on one of the two of the questions I'm going to ask. Uh, to, focusing on the future first, President Trump, you have repeatedly either contradicted or been at odds with some of your government's own top scientists. The week before last, the head of the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Redfield, said it would be summer before the vaccine would become generally available to the public. You said that he was confused and mistaken. Those were your two words. Yeah. But Dr. Slowey, the head of your Operation Warp Speed, has said exactly the same thing. Are they both wrong? Well, I've spoken to the companies, and we can have it a lot sooner. It's a very political thing, because people like this would rather make it political than save lives. God. It is a very political thing. I've spoken to Pfizer. I've spoken to all of the people that you have to speak to. We have great Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and others. They can go faster than that by a lot become very political, because the left, or I don't know if so, I call so him left, I don't know what I call So you're suggesting the head of your Operation Warp Speed, Dr. Smalley? I disagree with him. Yeah. No, I disagree with both of them. And he didn't say that. He said it could be there, but it could also be much sooner. I had him in my office two he days talk, ago. He talked about the summer, sir, before it's generally available, just like He Dr. said Redford. it's a possibility that we'll have 
the answer before November 1st. It could I'm, also I'm be after that. It's generally available. It, not well, we're going to deliver it right away. We have the military all set up logistically. They're all set up. We have our military that delivers soldiers, and they can do 200,000 a day. They're going to be this delivering. This is the same man it's who all told set you up. by Easter this would be gone away. By the warm weather, it'd be gone. Miraculous. It's like a miracle. And by the way, maybe you could inject some bleach in your arm, and that would take care of it. This is the that same man. That was said sarcastically, that was you seemed, know that. I, that I, was I, said sarcastically. And so here's the deal. This man is talking about a vaccine. Every serious, every serious company is talking about maybe having a vaccine done by the end of the year. But the distribution of that vaccine will not occur until sometime beginning or the middle of next year to get it out, if we get the vaccine. And pray God we will. Pray God we Mr. will. Mr. Vice President, I want to pick up the, You'll have on the that. vaccine I, I, I want to pick that. up on this question, though. You say the public can trust the scientists, but they can't trust President Trump. In fact, you said that again tonight. Your running mate, Senator Harris, goes further, saying the public health experts, quote, will be muzzled, will be suppressed. Given the fact that polls already show that people are concerned about the vaccine and are reluctant to take it, are you and your running mate, Senator Harris, contributing to that fear? No more than the question you just asked him. You pointed out he puts pressure and disagrees with his own scientist. But you're saying Everybody you can't, or, or Senator and, Harris is saying no, you can't trust the scientist. No, well, no, no, you can't trust the scientist. He did, she didn't say that. You can't she, trust She the, said the public health experts, quote, will be muzzled, will yes. be suppressed. Well, the, that's what he's going to try to do. But there's millions of scientists, there's thousands of scientists out there, like here at this great hospital, that don't work for him. Their job doesn't depend on him. That's not. They're the people. They're, and by I the way, to the scientists Fauci, that are in charge, by the way, they will have the vaccine very soon. Does, let him do you believe for a moment what he's telling you in light of all the lies he's told you about the whole issue relating to COVID? He still hasn't even acknowledged that he knew this was happening, knew how dangerous it was going to be back in February, and he didn't even tell you. He's on record as saying it. He panicked or he just looked at the stock market, one of the two, because guess what? A lot of people died, and a lot more are going to die unless he gets a lot smarter, a lot quicker. So, Mr. President? Did you use the word smart? Uh, so you said you went to Delaware State, but you forgot the name of your college. You didn't <laughs> go to so. Delaware State. You graduated either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Don't ever use that word. Oh, give me a break. Because you know what? There's nothing smart about you, Joe. 47 years, you've done nothing. Let's have this debate. And if you would have had, let me just tell you something, Joe. If you would have had the charge of what I was put through, I had to close the greatest economy in the history of our country. And by the way, now it's being built again. You see, he's going to get to the economy in the next segment, sir. Okay. It's going up fast. Okay. When it comes to how the virus has been handled so far, the two of you have taken very different approaches, and this is going to affect how the virus is handled going forward by whichever of you ends up becoming the next president. I want to quickly go through several of those. Reopenings. Vice President Biden, you have been much more reluctant than President Trump about reopening the economy and schools. Why, sir? Because he doesn't have a plan. If I were running, I'd know how th what the plan is. You've got to provide these businesses the ability to have the money to be able to reopen with the PPE, as well as with the sanitation they need. You have to provide Tell that them to Nancy Pelosi. To, to, well, he's just shush for a minute. Tell it to the, Nancy the, Pelosi and, and Schumer. By the way, Chuck. Nancy Pelosi and Schumer, they have a plan. He won't even meet with them. The Republicans won't meet with okay. the Senate. But and he, and he, sits, he sits on his golf course. And, well, I mean, nah. literally, okay. think about you it. You probably or, play more than it. I do, Joe. Uh, uh, oh. What about this question of reopenings and the fact— Well, he wants to shut down this country. Oh. And I want to keep it open. And we you did a great thing by shutting it down. He shut it down. Wait a minute, Joe. Let, let, let me shut sir. you down for a second, Joe, just for one second. <laughs> we want to— he wants to shut down the country. We just went through it. We had to, because we didn't know anything about the disease. Now we found that elderly people with heart problems and uh, diabetes and different problems are very, very vulnerable. We learned a lot. Young children aren't. Uh, even younger people aren't. We've learned a lot. But he wants to shut it down. Uh, More people will be hurt 
by continuing. If you look at Pennsylvania, if you look at certain states that have been shut down, they have Democrat governors all. One of the reasons they're shut down is because they want to keep it shut down until after the election mm -hmm. on yeah. November 3rd. I want to move on to another subject. I want to move on to another subject. I've got to respond. But those states, those states are not subject. doing well that are shut I've, down right now. But you've got to respond uh, to that. President Trump, shut down you have country. begun to increasingly question the effectiveness of masks as a disease preventer. And in fact, recently you have cited the, the issue of, of waiters touching their masks and touching plates. Are you questioning the, no, I think the, the masks efficacy are okay. of, of You have masks? to understand, if you look, I mean, I have a mask right here. I put a mask on, you know, when I think I need it. Tonight, as an example, everybody's had a test, and you've had social distancing and all of the things that you have to. But I Just wear like masks rallies. when needed. When needed, I wear masks. Okay, let me ask. I don't have. To, I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Uh, I will Vice, say. Vice, I will Vice, say this. Vice President Biden, go ahead, sir. Look, the way to open businesses is give them the wherewithal to be able to open. We provided money, the Congress— But I was asking you, sir, about masks. Well, masks, masks make a big difference. His own head of the CDC said if we just wore masks between now— if there, everybody wore masks in social distance between now and January, we'd probably save up to 100,000 lives. It matters. And they've also it said matters. the opposite. They've and also said no, the opposite. no serious person said the opposite. They've no also, well, look, serious I, 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 Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci said the he opposite. He did not I, I say the opposite. We've got he said a little very bit strongly, more than a minute left in this masks segment. Masks are not good. Then he changed his mind. He said, "Mask good. I, I I'm okay ask, with masks. I'm I want to ask you both masks. about one last subject, because your different approaches has even affected the way that you have campaigned. Uh, President Trump, you're holding large rallies with crowds packed together, thousands of people. Outside. Outside. Yes, sir. Agreed. Uh, Vice President Biden, you are holding much smaller uh, events with— nobody will show up. People with— <laughs> well, it's true. With, nobody shows up to his rallies. Okay, all right. In any case, why you holding the big rallies? Why you not? You go first, sir. Because people want to hear what I have to say. I mean, but are you I've done worried a great about job as a president, and I'll have 25, 35,000 people show up at airports. We use airports. Are you not worried about the We have disease a lot issues, of people— sir. Well, so far, we have had no problem whatsoever. It's outside. That's a big difference, according to the— experts, and we do them outside. We have tremendous crowds, as you see, I mean, every and, and literally on 24 hours' notice. And Joe does the circles and has three people someplace. Okay. Uh, by the way, did, this, you, did, this, did you see that, one of the last big rallies he had? And a reporter came up to him to ask him a question. He said, no, 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 stand back. Put on your mask. Put on a mask. Have you been tested? I'm way, I'm way far away from those other people. That's what he said. I can't. I'm going to be okay. He's not worried about you. He's not worried about the people out there breathing in one another. We've had no the negative effect. No, no negative, negative effect. effect. We've Come had on. no negative effect. And we've well, had 35, 40,000 right. people at these rallies. All right. Do you want to just yes. quickly finish yes. up? Because I want to move on to our next Yes, question. I would. He's been totally irresponsible the way in which he has handled the, the social distancing and people wearing masks, basically encouraged them not to. All right. Ben, he's a fool on this. If you could get the crowds, you would have done the same thing. But you can't. Nobody cares. Gentlemen, can we move on Nobody to the economy? Gentlemen, can we move on to the economy? Yes. The economy is, I think it's fair to say, recovering faster than expected from the shutdown. Much this, faster. In the second quarter, the unemployment rate fell to 8.4 percent last month. The Federal Reserve says the hit to, to growth, which is going to be there, is not going to be nearly as big as they had expected. President Trump, you say we are in a V-shaped recovery. Uh, Vice President Biden, you say it's more of a K-shape. What difference does that mean to the American people in terms of the economy? President Trump, in this segment, you go first. So we built the greatest economy in history. We closed it down because of the China plague. When the plague came in, we closed it down, which was very hard psychologically to do. He didn't think we should close it down, and he was wrong. And again, two million people would be dead now instead of still 204,000 people is too much. One person is too much. Should have never happened from China. But what happened is we closed it down and now we're reopening and we're doing record business. 
We had 10.4 million people in a four-month period that we've put back into the workforce. That's a record the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. And he wants to close down the — he will shut it down again. He will destroy this country. You know, a lot of people, between drugs and alcohol and depression, when you start shutting it down, you take a look at what's happening at some of your Democrat-run states where they have these tough shutdowns. And I'm telling you, it's because they don't want to open it. One of them came out last week. You saw that. Oh, we're going to open up on November 9th. Why November 9th? Because it's after the election. They think they're hurting us by keeping them closed. They're hurting people. People know what to do. They can social distance. They can wash the hands. They can wear masks. They can do whatever they want. But they got to open these states up. When you look at North Carolina, when you look — and these governors are under siege — Pennsylvania, Michigan, and a couple of others. You got to open these states up. It's not fair. You're talking about almost it's like being in prison. And you look at what's going on with divorce. Look at what's going on with alcoholism and drugs. It's a very, very sad thing. And he'll close down the whole country. This guy will close down the whole country and destroy our country. Our country is coming back incredibly well, setting records as it does it. We don't need somebody to come in and say, let's shut it down. All right. Your two minutes, sir. We're now moved to you. As I, as I said, posing the question, the president says it's a V-shaped recovery. You say it's a K-shaped recovery. What's the difference? The difference is millionaires and billionaires like him in the middle of the COVID crisis have done very well. Another billionaires have, raised, have made another $300 billion because of his profligate tax uh, uh, proposal, and he only focused on the market. But you folks at home, you folks living in Scranton and Claymont and all the small towns and working-class towns in America, how well are you doing? This guy paid well, a total of $750 in taxes. Sir, sir, wait, wait, no, sir. It's just wrong state. No, I understand. You've agreed to the two minutes, so please let him have it. Do I get my time back? The fact is that he has, in fact, worked on this in a way that he's going to be the first president of the United States to leave office, having fewer jobs in his administration than when he became president. Fewer jobs than when he became president. First one in American history. Secondly, the people who have lost their jobs are those people who have been on the front lines, those people who have been saving our lives, those people who have been out there dying, people who have been putting themselves in the way to make sure that we could all try to make it. And the idea that he is insisting that we go forward and open when you have almost half the states in America with a significant increase in COVID deaths and COVID cases in the United States. United States of America, and he wants to open it up more. Why does he want to open it up? Why doesn't he take care of the America? You can't fix the economy until you fix the COVID crisis. And he has no intention of doing anything about making it better for you all at home in terms of your health and your safety. Schools. Why aren't schools open? Because it costs a lot of money to open them safely. You know, they, they were going to give his administration going to give the teachers and school students masks, and then they decided no, couldn't do that because it's not. Not a national emergency. Not a national emergency. They've done nothing to help small businesses. Nothing. They're closing. One in six is now gone. He ought to get on the job and take care of the needs of the American people so we can open safely. All right. Your time is up, sir. Well, we are going to get to the— I we're have gonna, to respond to that. Well, you both had two minutes, sir. Excuse me. He made a statement. I, so did you. People want their schools — no, people want their schools open. They don't want to be shut down. They don't want their state shut down. They want their restaurants. I look at New York. It's so sad what's happening in New York. It's almost like a ghost town. And I'm not sure it can ever recover what they've done in New York. People want their places open. They want to get back to their lives. People They'll want be to careful, be safe. but they want their schools open. Okay. Want I'm the one safe. that brought back football. By the way, I brought back Big Ten <laughs> football. It was me, and it, I'm very happy to do it. And <laughs> All right, people let's, of let's, Ohio let's, are very proud of me. And you know how get I found out when he took the Gentlemen, we're going to get to your economic plans going forward in a moment. But first, Mr. President, as you well know, there's a new report that in 2016, the year you were elected president, and 2017, your first year as president, that you paid $750 a year in federal income tax each of those years. I know that you pay a lot of other taxes, but I'm asking you the specific question. Is it true that you paid $750 in federal income taxes each of those two years? I paid millions of dollars in taxes, millions of dollars of income tax. And let me just tell you, 
There was a story in one of the papers. That I, paid, your tax I paid $38 million one year. I paid $27 million Show us your tax one year. returns. I went. Uh, you'll see it as soon as it's finished. You'll see it. You know, oh. if you want to do, go to the Board of Elections. There's a 118-page or so report that says everything I have, every bank I have, I'm totally under leveraged because the assets are extremely good. And we have a very, we have a, we, I built Sir, a great I'm asking company. you a specific question, which but is. let me tell you. I, I understand all of that. I, I understand return. all of that. But, but let me, at, no, Mr. President, go ahead. I'm asking you a question. Will you tell us how much you paid in federal income taxes in 2016 and 2017? Millions of dollars. You paid millions of dollars? Millions in, of dollars, So yes. not seven hundred Millions of dollars, and you'll get to see I, it. I, and you'll get to when? see it. But and let me Shalom? just tell you, Chris, let me just tell you something, that it was the tax laws. I don't want to pay tax. Be before I came here, I was a private developer. I was a private business people. Like every other private person, unless they're stupid, they go through the laws, and that's what it is. He passed a tax bill that gave us all these privileges for depreciation and for uh, tax credits. We build a building and we get tax credits, like the hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. You get okay. a massive, which, by the way, was given to me by the Obama administration, if you can believe that. Now, the man got yeah, fired no, 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 right no. after that happened. But Vice that's President a, Biden, you want to respond? Yeah, I do want to respond. Look, the tax code that made him the, put him in a position that he pays less tax than a school teacher makes uh, the, uh, on the money a school teacher makes is because of him take. He says he's smart because he can take advantage of the tax code, and he does take advantage of the tax code. That's why I'm going to eliminate the Trump tax cuts, and we're going to I'm going to eliminate those tax okay. cuts and make sure that we invest in the people who, in fact, need the help. People out there need help. But why didn't you do it over 20, uh, in the no, last no, no, 25 no, years? No, because you weren't president. Why didn't you do it over because the last you weren't president years. screwing no, no, things no. up. You were a senator. You're and the, the worst way, president vice, America has ever had. Hey, hey, Come Joe, on. Let me, let me just tell you, Joe. I've done more in in 47 months. I've done more than you've done in 47 years, Joe. We've done things that you never even thought of doing, okay. including Gentlemen, fixing the broken military that you gave me, let's, including let's, taking care of we're your talking, Mr. President, we're talking about the economy. I'd like to ask you about your plans going forward, because, uh, Mr. Vice President, your economic plan, if you were to be yes, elected sir. president, uh, focuses a lot on big government, big taxes, big spending. I want to focus first on the taxes. You propose more than $4 trillion over a decade in new taxes on individuals making more than $400,000 a year and on corporations. President Trump says that that kind of an increase in taxes is going to hurt the economy as it's just coming out of a recession. Well, just take a look at what as the, the analysis has been done by Wall Street firms. Points out that my, my economic plan would create 7 million more jobs than his in four years, number one. And number two, it would create an additional $1 trillion in economic growth because it would be about buying American that we have to, we're going to make, the federal government spend $600 billion a year on everything from ships to steel to buildings and the like. And under my proposal, we're going to make sure that every penny of that has to be made by a company But, but respectfully, sir, I'm talking about taxes, not spending. Oh, well, by the way, I'm going to eliminate a significant number of the tax. I'm going to make the the... The corporate tax, 28 percent. It shouldn't be 21 percent. You have 19 company, 91 companies, federal, I mean, in the Fortune 500, who don't pay a single penny in tax, making billions of dollars. Why didn't you do it billions before of when you were vice president because, with Obama? Because you, in fact, passed that. That was right. your I tax it, proposal. I got it done. And you know what happened? Yeah, you got it done. Our economy boomed and, and, like it's and, never boomed. The economy well, is Mr. President, let, let me finish. Wait, no, let me, Mr. President, let me pick up on that. You would continue your free market approach, lower taxes, more deregulation, correct? Not lower taxes for the American people. But, but let me, Excuse me. But in, but in Obama's, you talk about the economy booming, it turns out that in Obama's final three years as president, more jobs were created, a million and a half more jobs than in the first three years of your presidency. They had the slowest recovery since 19, uh. economic recovery since 1929. It was the slowest recovery. Also, they took over something that was down here. All you had to do is turn on the lights and you pick up a lot. But they had the well, slowest yeah. economic recovery since 1929. Let me tell you about the stock market. When the stock market goes up, that means jobs. It also means 401ks. 
If you got in, if you ever became president with your ideas, you want to terminate my tax, my taxes, I, I'll tell you what, you'll lose half of the companies that have poured in here will leave, and plenty half of companies, of companies that are already here, they'll leave for other places. Have they will leave, and you will have a I depression mean, the likes I've, I've, of which you've never seen. Look, Mr. we Vice inherited it. The worst recession short of a depression in American history. I was asked to bring it back. We were able to have an economic recovery that created the jobs you're talking about. We handed him a booming economy. He blew it. It wasn't he booming. It. He blew it. Wasn't it wasn't booming. It was, was a, it was the weakest the, recovery well, sir, is since it to, Wait, wait. Is it, fair to, is it fair to say he blew it when, in when fact, COVID there was no. when there was record un low unemployment yeah. before COVID? Yeah, but, but because what he did, even before COVID, manufacturing went in the Hole. Manufacturing went in a hole. Excuse number me, one. Chris. Wait. Number two. Chris. Number three. They said they, it would they, take. They, no, you're number two. No. Chris, Chris. They said it would this take a miracle sorry. to bring back manufacturing. I brought back 700,000 jobs. They brought back nothing. They gave up on manufacturing. We Part did of not my agree standard that. fare. I'm the guy that he brought totally back gave the automobile up on manufacturing. Right, let him we brought back, I was asked to bring back Chrysler and General Motors. We brought them back right here in the state of Ohio and Michigan. He blew it. They're gone. He blew it. And in fact, they're going. Ohio had the best year it's ever had last year. Michigan yeah. had the best year they've ever had. That is not Many true. Many car companies no, came no, in from Germany, from not, Japan, no, went to Michigan, no, went to no, Ohio. They're not having And they Mr. didn't Vice, come wait, wait, in with you. Mr. Vice President, go ahead. And so you take a look at what he's actually done. He's done very little. His trade deals are the same way. He talks about these great trade deals. You know, he talks about the art of the deal. China's made, perfected the art of the steel. We have a higher deficit with China now than we did before. We have the highest deficit, trade deficit China with ate Mexico. Your lunch, All right, ate your lunch. And, and, and China yeah. ate your lunch, no. Joe. And but, no wonder okay. your son goes in and he takes out, he takes out oh. billions of dollars takes out billions of dollars to manage. He makes millions of dollars. And also, Simply while we're at true. it, why Simply is it, true. just out of curiosity, the mayor of Moscow's wife gave your son three and a half million dollars. What did he true. do to deserve it? That what did he do with Barista to deserve that. $183,000? You've asked, sir, none you've asked that your question, not an answer. If not, none of that is true. Oh, really? He totally didn't get no. hey, million? Mr. President, it's Mr. Totally, President, please. Totally discredited it. Totally discredited. And by the way, well, wait, he didn't get three and a half million dollars, Joe. Mr. Vice, he got three and a half million dollars. It is not true. Oh, really, Mr. Oh. President? But, Mr. You, it's an it's an open discussion. Please, now, you, you, it's a fact. I, well, There's, you have not raised an fact. issue. Let the Vice totally President answer. Discredited. Did Barista was a pay report. him one hundred eighty-three thousand a month? With, with, with no with experience you, in energy? Mi Mr. Look, President, no my son did nothing wrong at Barista. I think he did, Mr. President. Let him answer. He doesn't want to let me answer because he knows I have the truth. His, his position has been totally, thoroughly discredited. By who? And the media. By everybody. Well, by the, by media, the media, by our allies, by the World Bank, by, e by everyone has discredited. As a matter of Dude, fact, it, matter of fact, Mr. even President, the people who testified under oath. So let me ask you this: Andrew, 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 No, no, Andrew, go ahead, Mr. Andrew, I'm listening to you. People under you got three and a half he, million dollars from Moscow. Te he testified under oath in his administration. Said, "I did my job and I did it very well. Oh, really? I did it I'd honorably." I like don't know who they are. Every, well, I'll give you the list I'll of the people them. who testified. No, no, go ahead, sir. Sure, you, they, you've already fired most of them because they did some a good job. Some people don't well, do a good here's job. The, with you, Go ahead. you get the, wait a minute. You get the final word, Mr. Well, it's hard to get any word in with this clown. Excuse me. This, hey, hey this let me person. just tell you. No, no, no. I'm no. Mr. President. Three and, I'm and a half Mr. million, President. Joe. That is simply. Why did not he deserve true. three and a half million it from did, Moscow? Look, here's the deal. We want to talk about families and ethics. I don't want to do that. I mean, his family, we could talk about all night. His family's my already... Family, no, no, let him go. My oh, family already lost wrote. a fortune by coming down ahead. and helping go us ahead. with government. Ahead, and that's such a... Right here, Mr. That's such a great, single one of them lost This is a not about Mr. my family or his family. It's about your family. They the American three people. And a half million he doesn't... Dollars. That's not true. It doesn't want to talk about what you need. You, the American people. It's about you. That's what we're talking about. All right, that's the end of the segment. We're moving on. He didn't take them. Well, Vice President, a, Chris, no. Can I be honest? It's a very important try to question. Be honest. No, I, he I, stood I, I, up. No, he stood I, I, up. The answer to the question is no. Ukraine. No, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you that don't get rid is of absolutely you know what? You're really not you're true. Tape you're doing it. You're going to have tape. true. Gentlemen, is, <laughs> I hate to raise Chris, my voice, but it seems tape. to be, why shouldn't I be different than the two of you? So here's the deal. Good point. We have 
five, six segments. We have ended that segment. We're going to go to the next segment. In that segment, you each are going to have two uninterrupted moments. In those two interrupted minutes, Mr. President, you can say anything you want. I'm going to ask a question about race, but if you want to answer about something else, go ahead. But we, it, we, I think that the country would be better served if we allowed both people to speak with fewer interruptions. I, I'm appealing to you, sir, to do that. Well, and him, too. Well, frankly, you've been doing more interrupting well, than he right, has. that's all right, but he does plenty. Well, less than, <laughs> sir, less does than... plenty. No, he less does. than you have. Let's please continue on. The issue of race. Vice President Biden, you say that President Trump's response to the violence in Charlottesville three years ago when he talked about very fine people on both sides was what directly led you to launch this run for president. Oh, yeah, sure. President Trump, you have often said that you believe you have done more for black Americans than any president, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. My question for the two of you is why should voters trust you rather than your opponent to deal with the race issues facing this country over the next four years. Vice President Biden, you go first. It's about equity and equality. It's about decency. It's about the Constitution. And we have never walked away from trying to require equity for everyone, equality for the whole of America. But we've never accomplished it. But we've never walked away from it like he has done. It is true. The reason I got in the race is when those people, close your eyes, remember what those people look like coming out of the fields carrying torches, their veins bulging, spewing, just spewing anti-Semitic bile and accompanied by the Ku Klux Klan. A young woman got killed and they asked the president what he thought. He said there were very fine people on both sides. No president has ever said anything statement. like that. It, it, it is his now, who second, it, sir. Second point I'd make to you is that when Floyd was killed, when Mr. Floyd was killed, there was a peaceful protest in front of the White House. What did he do? He came out of his bunker, had the military do use tear gas on him so he could walk across to a church and hold up a Bible. And then what happened after that? The bishop of that very church said that it was a disgrace. The general who was with him said he all he, all he ever wants to do is divide people, not unite people at all. This is a president who has used everything as a dog whistle to try to generate racist hatred, racist division. This is a man who, in fact, you talk about helping African Americans, one in 1,000 African Americans has been killed because of the coronavirus. And if he doesn't do something quickly, by the end of the year, one in 500 will have been killed. One in 500 African Americans. This man, this man is the, is the savior of African Americans? This man cares at all? This man's done virtually nothing. Look, the fact is that you have to look at what he talks about. You have to look at what he did. And what he did has been disastrous for the African-American community. So, Pre President Trump, you have two minutes. Why should Americans right. trust you over your opponent to deal with racism? He did a crime bill, 1994, where you call them super predators, African-Americans, super predators. And they've no, never sir. forgotten it. They've never forgotten it, Joe. No, no, sir. It's his two minutes. So you did that, and they call you a super predator. And I'm letting people out of jail now that you have treated the African-American population community, you have treated the black community about as bad as anybody in this country. You did the 1990 And that's why, if you look at the polls, I'm doing better than any Republican has done in a long time, because they saw what you did. You call them super predators, and you've called them worse than that, because you look back at your testimony over the years, you've called them a lot worse than that. As far as the church is concerned, and as far as the generals are concerned, we just got the support of 200 mil 250 military leaders and generals. Total support. Law enforcement, almost every law enforcement group in the United States. I have Florida. I have Texas. I have Ohio. I have every, excuse me, Portland. The sheriff just came out today and he said, I support President Trump. I don't think you have any law enforcement. You can't even say the word law enforcement, because if you say those words, you're going to lose all of your radical left supporters. And why aren't you saying those words, Joe? Why don't you say the words law enforcement? Because you know what? If they called us in Portland, we would put out that fire in a half an hour, but they won't do it because they're run by radical left Democrats. If you look at Chicago, if you look at any place you want to look, Seattle, they heard we were coming in the following day and they put up their hands and we got back 
back Seattle. Minneapolis, we got it back, Joe, because we believe in law and order, but you don't. The top 10 cities and just about the top 40 cities are run by Democrats and, in many cases, radical left. And they've got you wrapped around their finger, Joe, to a point where you don't want to say anything about law and order. And I'll tell you what, the people of this country want and demand law and order, and you're afraid to even say it. All right. I want, to, I want to return to the question of race. Vice President Biden, after the grand jury in the Breonna Taylor case, decided not to charge any of the police with homicide, you said it raises the question, quote, whether justice could be equally applied in America. Do you believe that there is a separate but unequal system of justice for blacks in this country? Yes, there is. There's, a, there's a systemic injustice in this country, in education, in work, and in, in, in law enforcement, and in the, in the way in which it's enforced. But look, the vast majority of police officers are good, decent, honorable men and women. They risk their lives every day to take care of us. But there are some bad apples. And when they occur, when they find them, they have to be sorted out. They have to be held accountable. They have to be held accountable. And what I'm going to do as President of the United States is call a, a, together an entire group of people at the White House, well, everything from the civil rights groups to the police officers, the police chiefs, and we're going to work this out. We're going to work this out so we change the way in which we have more transparency in when these things happen. These cops aren't happy to see what happened to, to, to George Floyd. These co cops aren't happy to see what happened to Breonna Taylor. Most don't like it. But we have to have a system where people are held accountable. When, and by the way, violence in response is never appropriate. Never appropriate. Peaceful protest is. Violence is never appropriate. All right, Ms. What is peaceful President, protest? When they run through the middle President, of the town Trump, and burn down President your stores Trump, and kill people President all over Trump, the place, that and you is say not peaceful, peaceful protest? President Trump, no, it's I'm not, not asking. you say it is. President Trump, I'd like to continue with yes, the issue of ahead, race. Please. I promise we're going to get to the issue of law and order please. in a moment. Fine. This month, your administration uh, directed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity training that addresses white privilege or critical race theory. Why did you decide to do that, to end racial sensitivity training? And do you believe that there is systemic racism in this country, sir? I ended it because it's racist. I ended it because a lot of people were complaining that they were asked to do things that were absolutely insane, that it was a radical a revolution that was taking place in our military, uh, in our schools, all over the place, and you know it, and so does what, everybody what, what else. Is radical, and he would know. What is oh, radical totally about racist. racial sensitivity training? Sir. If you were a certain person, you had no status in life. It was sort of a reversal. And if you look at the people, we were paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars to teach very bad ideas and, frankly, very sick ideas. And, and really, they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. We have to go back to the core values of this country. They were teaching people that our country is a horrible place, it's a racist place, and they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm no not going to allow that to happen. Vice President Biden? Nobody's doing that. He's just, he's oh, the you, racist. You, you just don't. Here's the deal. I, I know a lot more about you this. Don't. Than he does. Let him finish. The fact is that there is racial insensitivity. People have to be made aware of what other people feel like. What, what insults them, what is demeaning to them. It's important that people know they don't want to. Many people don't want to hurt other people's feelings, but it's, it makes a big difference. It makes a gigantic difference in the way a child is able to grow up and have a, self, a sense of self-esteem. It's a little bit like how this guy and, and his friends look down on so many people. They look down their nose on people like Irish Catholics like me and grew up in Scranton. They look down on people who don't have money. They look down on people who are of a different faith. They look down on people who are a different color. In fact, we're all Americans. The only way we're going to bring this country together is bring everybody together. There's nothing we cannot do if we do it together. We can take this on and we can defeat racism Vice in America. President, I mean, President Trump, sir. During the Obama-Biden administration, there was tremendous division. There was hatred. You look at uh, Ferguson, you look at 
You go to very many places. Look at Oakland. Look what happened in Oakland. Look what happened in Baltimore. Look what happened. On, frankly, it was more violent than what I'm even seeing now. Oh, my but Lord. the reason this is, is that ridiculous. the Democrats that Absolutely run these cities ridiculous. don't want to talk like you about law and order. Violent and you crime. still haven't mentioned. Violent Are you crime. in favor of law and order? I'm in favor of law. You follow. Are you in favor of law and order? Go yes, ahead. Yes, I'm you ask a question. Let him finish. Law and order. Law and order. Let him. Law and order with justice, where people will get treated fairly. Okay. And the fact of the matter is, violent crime went down 17 percent, 15 percent in our administration. All right. It's gone up went, on his watch. Went down he, much more he, he than had, ours. All right. We're, he we're now, you're, Mr. Of Mr. President, you're going to be very happy. Mr. President, every record in the Mr. Book. President, you're going to be very happy because we're now going to talk about law and order. Places we had trouble. We're Democratic-run cities. That's exactly my Democratic. question. There has been a dramatic increase in homicides in America this summer particularly, and you often blame that on Democratic mayors and Democratic governors, but in fact there have been equivalent spikes in Republican-led cities like Tulsa and Fort Worth. So the question is, is this really a party issue? I think it's a party issue. You can bring in a couple of examples, but if you look at Chicago, what's going on in Chicago, where uh, 53 people were shot and eight died shot. If you look at New York, where it's going up like nobody's ever seen anything, the numbers are going up 100, 150, 200 percent uh, crime. It's, it is cities. crazy what's going on. Republican. And he doesn't want to say law and order because he can't, because he'll lose his radical left supporters. And once he does that, it's over with. But if he ever got to run this country and they ran it the way he would want to run it, we would have we would our suburbs would be gone. By the suburbs. way, our suburbs would be gone. And you would see problems like you've he never would seen. Know right. a Suburb, unless he took a wrong turn. Oh, I know suburbs. He would not. So much I was better. Raised, Go ahead. I would, Wait a minute. I was so raised in the suburbs. This is not 1950. All these dog whistles and racism don't work anymore. Suburbs are by and large integrated. There are as many people today driving their kids to soccer practice and or to uh, black and white and Hispanic in the same car as there have been any time in, in the past. What's, what really is a threat to the suburbs and their safety is his failure to deal with COVID. They're dying in the suburbs. His failure to deal with the environment. They're being flooded. They're being burned out because okay. his refusal to do anything. That's why the suburbs are in trouble. I, I do want to talk about this issue of law and order, though. And in the joint recommendation that came from the Biden-Bernie Sanders task force, you talked about, quote, reimagining policing. Yeah. First of all, what does reimagining policing mean, and do you support— It means— uh, uh, Let me—if I might finish the question. What does reimagining policing mean, and do you support the Black Lives Matter uh, call for, uh, for community control of policing? Look, what I support is the police having the opportunity to deal with the problems they face. And I'm, not, I'm totally opposed to defunding the police offices. As a matter of fact, police, local police, the only one defunding in his budget calls for a $400 million cut in local law enforcement assistance. They need more assistance. They need, when they show up for a 9-11 call, to have someone with them as a psychologist or psychiatrist to keep them from having to use force and be able to talk people down. We have to have community policing like we had before, where the officers get to know the people in the communities. That's when crime went down down. It didn't go up. It went down. And so we have to be engaged. That's not what they're private. talking about, that's, Chris. That's well, not what that, they're talking about. He's talking exactly, about defunding the that, police. That is not true. He doesn't have any would, law would you, support. Look, he has no law enforcement That's support. not true. Almost that's nothing. Not, that, look. Oh, really? Who do you have? Name one group that supports you. Name one group that came out and supported you. Go look, ahead. Look, think. We have time. We don't have time to do no, anything. No, no. Think so, all right. Name folks, one law enforcement folks. group that came well, I think, out and I supported think, gentlemen, you. Gentlemen, I think I'm going to take back the there moderator's are, role, and I, want, and I want to get to another subject, which is the issue of protests in many cities that have turned violent. In Portland, Oregon especially, we had a, more than 100 straight days of protests which I think you would agree, you talk about peaceful protests, many of those turned We're into riots. Mr. Vice President, you say that people who commit crimes should be held accountable. The question I have, though, is, as the Democratic nominee, and earlier tonight you said that you are the Democratic Party right now, have you ever called the Democratic mayor of Portland or the Democratic governor of Oregon and said, Hey, you got to stop this. Bring in the National Guard. Do whatever it takes, but you stop the days and months of violence in Portland. I don't hold public office now. 
I am a former vice president. I've made it clear. I've made it clear in my public statements that the violence should be prosecuted. It should be prosecuted. And anyone who commits it but should be But you've never prosecuted. called for the people, uh, the, the leader, excuse me, sir. You have never called for the leaders in Portland and in Oregon to call and bring they, in the National Guard and knock well, off a hundred days of riots. They can, in fact, take care of it if he just stay out of the way. Oh, Look, here, oh really? Here, oh, really? Here's well, the thing. No, no, I that, sent sorry, in the no, wait, U.S. Marshals to get the killer no, of a young man in the middle of the street. They shot him. Uh, and for three Mr. days, President Trump, Trump, Portland President wouldn't Trump, do anything. I had to send in the U.S. Marshals. President they Trump, took care of business. Go ahead, and, sir. And by the way, you know, his own former spokesperson said, you know, riots and chaos and violence help his cause. That's what this is all about. I don't know who said that. I do. Who? I think who? It, Kellyanne Conway. I don't think she said, she said that. She said that. And know. so here's the, all right. but here's the point. Go ahead. The point is that that's what he is keeps trying to rile everything up. He doesn't want to calm things down. Instead of going in and talking to people and saying, let's get everybody together, figure out how to deal with this. What's he do? He just pours gasoline in the fire constantly and every single solitary okay, time. Okay, and, and to end this, button up this segment, I'm going to give you a minute to answer, sir. You have repeatedly well, criticized— wait, I have to answer his statement. No, I, you have his repeatedly— statement. Wait, you have repeat, No, second. you've been talking he back and forth. He made a forth. statement. I'm asking you— I would love to end it. I would love to end it. You know, if you want to switch seats— we, we would could very quickly. We can do that, but I'd I'm saying no, in the National I'm, Guard, it would be over. There'd be no problem. Okay. But they right. don't want to accept the National Guard. You have repeatedly we, criticized the, the vice president for not specifically calling out Antifa and other left wing extremist right. groups. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not? add to the violence in a number of these cities, as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what, 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 you, you uh, what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right boys. Like white proud supremacists boys. and right proud proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left because this is not a right his wing own, problem. His this, own is FBI this is a left wing. This is a left wing problem. White supremacist. Antifa is an idea, not an organization. Oh, you got it. Not kidding. malicious. That's what oh, his it's an FBI, idea. his okay. FBI director Gentlemen, said. Well, we're then gonna, you know what? No, no, no. We're, do, we're done, sir. Everybody, we're moving on to the next. Everybody, we're moving on to the next. Your head, that's not an idea. Everybody in your administration tells you the truth is a bad idea. Can I tell you what? You have no idea. Antifa, Antifa is a dangerous radical All right, radical gentlemen, group. we're now moving on to the Trump and, and Biden records. Them. They'll overthrow you. When a president—I'm going to ask a question. When the president seeks a second term, it is generally a referendum on his record. But Vice President Biden, you like to quote one of your dad's sayings, which is, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And in this case, sir, you are the alternative. Looking. At both of your records, I'm going to ask each of you, why should voters elect you president over your opponent in this segment? President Trump, you go first. Two minutes. Because there has never been an administration or president who has done more than I've done in a period of three and a half years. And that's despite the impeachment hoax. And you saw what happened today with Hillary Clinton, where it was a whole big con job. But despite going through all of these things where I had a fight both flanks and behind me and, and above, there has never been an administration that's done what I've done. The greatest, before COVID came in, the greatest economy in history, lowest unemployment numbers. Everything was good. Everything was going. And by the way, there was unity going to happen. People were calling me for the first time in years. They were calling and they were saying, it's time maybe. And then what happened? We got hit, but now we're building it back up again. A rebuilding of the military, including Space Force and all of the other things. A, a fixing of the, the VA, which was a mess under him. 308,000 people died because they didn't have proper health care. He, he was a mess. And we now got a 91 percent approval rating at the VA, our vets. We take care of our vets. But we've rebuilt our military. The job that we've done, and, and I'll tell you something, some people say maybe the most 
most important. By the end of the first term, I'll have approximately 300 federal judges and court of appeals judges, 300, and hopefully three great Supreme Court judges, justices. That is a record, the likes of which very few people. And you know one of the reasons I'll have so many judges? Because President Obama and him left me 128 judges to fill. When you leave office, you don't leave any judges. That's like you just don't do that. They left 128 openings. And if I were a member of his party, because they have a little different philosophy, I'd say, if you left us 128 openings, you can't be a good president. You can't be a good vice president. But I want to thank you, because it gives us almost — it'll probably be above that number by the end of this term. I'm sorry. 300 judges. It's a record. Looking at both your records, why should voters elect you president as opposed to President Under Trump? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Under this president, we become weaker, sicker, poor, more divided, and more violent. When I was vice president, we inherited a recession. I was asked to fix it. I did. We left him a booming economy, and he caused the recession. With regard to being weaker, the fact is that I've gone head to head with Putin and made it clear to him we're not going to take any of his stuff. He's Putin's puppy. He still refuses to even say anything to Putin about the bounty on the heads of American soldiers. Your son got and three no, no, no. million dollars. Sure. And Mr. by the way, Mr. my son. Mr. Wait a minute. Mr. President, your campaign agreed to both sides would get two minute answers uninterrupted. Well, your, your side agreed to it. And why don't you observe what your campaign agreed to as a ground rule, okay, sir? He never keeps his word. Because can you add no, back, sir? No, no, I'm not asking. That, that was a rhetorical question. Can you go add ahead, back sir? back 30 seconds? Yeah, because, yes, okay. you may have. All right. Go ahead. So, thirdly, we're poor. The billionaires have gotten much, much more wealthy by a tune of over four, three to $400 billion more just since COVID. You in the home, you got less. You're in more trouble than you were before. In terms of being more violent, when we were in office, there were 15 percent less violence in America than there is today. He's president of the United States. It's on his watch. And with regard to more divided, the nation can't stay divided. We can't be this way. And speaking of my son, the way you talk about the military, the way you talk about them being losers and being and, 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 and just being suckers, my son was in Iraq. He spent a year there. He got, the, he got the Bronze Star. He got the Conspicuous Service Medal. He was not a loser. He was a patriot. And the people left behind okay. there were heroes. Really? And I resent Are you talking like about Hunter? Hell. Are you talking about I'm Hunter? I'm talking about my son, Bo Biden. You're talking I don't about know. I don't know, Bo. I know Hunter. Yeah, Hunter, you know got Bo. Thrown, Hunter got thrown out of the military. He was thrown out, dishonorably discharged. That's not true. It wasn't dishonorably. cocaine use. And he didn't have a job until you became vice president. Once you None became of that vice president, true. he made a fortune in Ukraine, in China, in Moscow, that is simply and various not other places. True. He my made son, a fortune. Gentlemen, my son. And he didn't have a job. My son, like a lot of people, like a lot of people we know at home, had a drug problem. He's overtaken it. He's, he's, he's fixed it. He's worked on it. And I'm proud of him. But why was he given tens of millions of dollars? But he wasn't given tens of millions of dollars. That is totally, that's a totally discredited. You've already, we've already been through, totally we've already discredited. We've both, we've already been through this. I think the American people would rather hear about more substantial so subjects. Well, you know, yes. as the moderator, sir, I'm going to make a, know, a judgment call here. I know, but when somebody gets three and a half million okay, dollars right. from the Let's mayor talk about of Moscow, that's not true. I think true. it's a terrible That report is totally Why discredited. I, I, I Mitt think Romney on that committee said it wasn't worth taxpayers' Gen money, that report. It was written for political you, reasons. You know, I'd like to talk about climate change. So would I. Okay. The forest fires in the West are raging now. They have burned millions of acres. They have displaced hundreds of thousands of people. When state officials there blame the fires on climate change, Mr. President, you said, I don't think the science knows. Over your four years, you have pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord. You have rolled back a number of Obama environmental records. What do you believe about the science of climate change, and what will you do in the next four years to confront it? I want crystal clean water and air. I want beautiful, clean air. We have now the lowest carbon. If you look at our numbers right now, 
we are doing phenomenally. But I haven't destroyed our businesses. Our businesses aren't put out of commission. If you look at the Paris Accord, it was a disaster from our standpoint. And people are actually very happy about what's going on because our businesses are doing well. As far as the fires are concerned, you need forest management in addition to everything else. The forest floors are loaded up with trees, dead trees that are years old and they're like tinder and leaves and everything else. You drop a cigarette in there, the whole forest burns down. You've got to have forest management. What do you You've believe? Got to have cuts. What do you believe about the science of climate change, sir? Uh, I believe that we have to do everything we can to have immaculate air, immaculate water, and do whatever else we can that's good. You know, we're planting a billion trees, the billion tree project, project and it's very exciting. You believe for a lot that, of people. that human pollution, gas, greenhouse gas emissions contributes to the global warming of the planet? I think planet? a lot of things do, but I think to an extent, yes. I think to an extent, yes. But I also think we have to do better management of our forests. Every year, I get the call, California's burning. California's burning. If that was cleaned, if that were, if you had forest management, good forest management, you wouldn't be getting those calls. You know, in Europe, they live their forest cities. They're called forest cities. They maintain their forests. They manage their forests. I was with the head of a major country. It's a forest city. He said, sir, we have trees that are far more, they, they ignite much easier than California. There shouldn't be that problem. I spoke with the governor about it. I'm getting along very well with the governor. But I said, you know, at some point, you can't every year have hundreds of thousands of acres of land just burned to the ground. But sir, That's but, burning down because of a lack of but management. But, sir, if you believe in the science of climate change, why have you rolled back the Obama clean power plan, which limited carbon emissions in power plants, why have you relaxed— Because it was driving you, energy prices through the sky. Why have you relaxed fuel economy standards that are going to create more pollution from cars well, and trucks? Well, not really, because what's happening is the car is much less expensive, and it's a much safer car, and you're talking about a tiny difference, and then what would happen, because of the cost of the car, you would have at least double and triple the number of cars purchased. We have the old slugs out there that are 10, 12 years old. If you did that, the car would be safer. It would be much cheaper by $3,500. In the, in the case of California, they simply no, but you would take your, a lot of cars now. off the market because people would be able to afford a car. Now, so, and by the way, we're going to see how that turns out. But a lot of people agree with me, many people. The car has gotten so expensive because they have computers all over the place for an extra little bit okay. of gasoline. And, by the, and, and, and I'm okay with electric cars, too. I think I'm all for electric cars. I've given big incentives for electric cars. But what they've done in California is just all crazy. Right. Vice President Biden, I'd like you to, to respond to the president's climate change record, but I also want to ask you about a concern. You proposed $2 trillion in green jobs. You talk about new limits, not abolishing, but new limits on fracking, ending the use of fossil fuels to generate electricity by 2035, and zero net emission of greenhouse gases by 2050. The president says a lot of these things would tank the economy and cost millions of jobs. He's absolutely wrong, number one. Number two, if, in fact, when, when our, during our administration, the Recovery Act, I was able to, I was in charge, able to bring down the cost of renewable energy to cheaper than or as cheap as coal and gas and oil. Nobody's going to build another uh, uh, coal-fired plant in America. No one's going to build another oil-fired plant in America. They're going to move to renewable energy, number one. Number two, we're going to make sure that we are able to take the federal fleet and turn it into a fleet that's run on their electric vehicles, making sure that we can do that. We're going to put 500,000 charging stations and all of the highways that we're going to be building in the future. We're going to build an economy that, in fact, is going to provide for the ability of us to take 4 million buildings and make sure that they, in fact, are weatherized in a way that, in fact, will, they'll, they'll emit significantly less gas and oil because the heat will not be going out. There's so many things that we can do now to create thousands and thousands of jobs. We can get to net zero in terms of energy production by 2035, not only not costing people jobs, creating jobs, creating millions of good-paying jobs, not 15 bucks an hour, but prevailing wage, 
by having a new infrastructure that, in fact, is green. And the first thing I will do, I will rejoin the Paris Accord. I will join the Paris Accord because with us out of it, look what's happening. It's all falling apart. And talk about someone who has no, no relationship to, with foreign policy. Brazil, the rainforests of Brazil are being torn down, are being ripped down. More, more carbon is absorbed in that rainforest than every bit of carbon that's emitted in the United States. Instead of doing something about that, I would be gathering up and making sure we had the, com the countries of the world coming up with $20 billion and say, here's $20 billion. Stop, stop tearing down the forest. And if you don't, then you're going to have significant economic consequences. What about, what about the argument that President Trump basically says that you have to balance environmental interests and economic interests, and he's drawn his line? Well, he hadn't drawn a line. He still, for example, makes sure that we—he wants to make sure that methane's not a problem. We can—you you can now emit more methane without it being a problem. Methane. Right. This is a guy who says that you don't have to have mileage standards for automobiles that exist now. This is a guy who says that— well, the fact is, it, no, it, 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 it's all true. And here's He's the talking deal. about the Green he, New Deal, and it's not two billion I'm, or twenty billion, as you said. I'm it's one hundred trillion dollars. I'm talking about where they the want to rip down plan. buildings go minute, and, go. and rebuild the building. No, it's the dumbest, not, most ridiculous. Not, where airplanes are out of minute, business, that's that's where two car systems are out, where they want true. to take out the cows too. Not you know, that's true. not true either, right? Not this true. is a this is a one hundred trillion. Look, that's more money. Than than our country could make in a hundred years if we're not going to the case. All right, let me, let me, let me, let me destroy because, our country. Because I actually, wait a minute, sir. I actually <laughs> have studied your plan, and it includes upgrading four million buildings, weatherizing yes. two million homes over four years, building one and a half million energy efficient homes. So the question becomes, some, the president is saying, I think some people who support the president would say that sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money and hurt the economy. What it's going to do is going to create thousands and millions of jobs, good paying trillion. jobs. But let him finish, sir. He doesn't know how to do that. $100 they, billion. Dollars. The fact is, it's going to create millions of good paying jobs and these tax incentives to people for people to weatherize, which he wants to get, get rid of. It's going to make the economy much safer. Look how much we're paying now to deal with the hurricanes. With the deal with, by the way, he has an answer for hurricanes. He said maybe we should drop a nuclear weapon on them. They may. I oh, never said that. That's at all. He did say. You made that. it up. Uh, and here's the deal. You make up a we, we are going to be in a position where we can create hard, hard, good jobs by making sure the environment is clean and we all are in better shape. We spend billions of dollars now, billions of dollars on floods, hurricanes, rising seas. We're in real trouble. Look what's happened just in the Midwest with these storms that come through and wipe out entire sections and counties in Iowa. They didn't happen before. They're because of global warming. We make up 15 percent of the world's problem. We, in fact, but the, the rest of the world, we've got to get them to come along. That's why we have to get back into, back into the Paris Accord. All right, gentlemen. Well, wait a minute, Chris. So why didn't he do it for 47 years? You were vice president. Why didn't you get the world? China sends up real dirt into the air. Russia does. India does. They all do. We're supposed to be good. And by the way, he made a couple of statements. The Green New Deal is a hundred trillion dollars. That is not, not my plan. That's the Green uh, well, New you Deal. Well, want to rebuild every building. My plan. Right. I want to rebuild right. every. If he knew have, anything wait, about, no, no, wait. if he Gentlemen, knew anything about, he made a about, statement Gentlemen. about the military. Yeah, he yeah, said yeah. I said something about the military. Okay. He and his friends made it up, and then they went with it. I never said it. Okay, that is what not he true. did. Sir, is he you're said, done in this segment. He called the military stupid bastards. I did not say it. He said stupid bastards. He said it. Stop. I would never say that. Stop. Play it. Go ahead. Mr. You're Vice President, uh, answered his qu his final question. The final question is, I can't remember which of all his rantings. <laughs> <was the laughs> I'm, I'm having a little trouble That's myself. Right. But, uh, and, and about the economy and about this question of what it's going to cost. The, the, economy, the economy. I mean, the Green New Deal the, and the, the idea of what, what the, your the environmental changes deal, will do. The Green New Deal will pay for itself as we move forward. We're not going to build plants that, in fact, are great polluting plants. Do you support build the Green New Deal? P pardon me? Do you support that? No, I don't support the Green oh, New Deal. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, well that's a big that, statement. I support that means you the, just the radical left. I, su okay. I support oh, the don't. Biden plan that I put forward. Okay. 
the Biden plan, which is different than what he calls the radical Green New Deal. All right, gentlemen, final segment, election integrity. As we meet tonight, millions of Americans are receiving mail-in ballots or going to vote early. How confident should we be that this will be a fair election? And what are you prepared to do over the next five plus weeks? Because it'll not only be to election day, but also counting some ballots, mail-in ballots after election day. What are you prepared to do to reassure the American people that the next president will be the legitimate winner of this election in this final segment? Mr. Vice President, you go first. Prepare to let people vote. They should go to IWillVote.com. Decide how they're going to vote, when they're going to vote, and what means by which they're going to vote. His own Homeland Security Director, and as well as the FBI Director, says there is no evidence at all that mail-in ballots are a source of, of being manipulated and cheating. They said that. The fact is that there are going to be millions of people because of COVID that are going to be voting by mail-in ballots, like he does, by the way. He sits behind the Resolute Desk and sends his ballot to Florida, number one. Number two, we're going to make sure that those people who want to vote in person are able to vote because enough poll watchers are there to make sure they can socially distance. The polls are open on time, and their polls stay open until the votes are counted. And this is all about trying to dissuade people from voting because he's trying to, con <laughs> to scare people into thinking that it's not going to be legitimate. Show up and vote. You will determine the outcome of this election. Vote, vote, vote. If you're able to vote early in your state, vote early. If you're able to vote in person, vote in person. Vote whatever way is the best way for you, because you will. He cannot stop you from being able to determine the outcome of this election. And in terms of whether or not when the votes are counted and they're all counted, that will be accepted. If I win, that will be accepted. If I lose, that will be accepted. But by the way, if in fact he says he's not sure sure what he's going to accept? Well, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter, because if we get the votes, it's going to be all over. He's going to go. He can't stay in power. It won't happen. It won't happen. So vote. Just make sure you understand you have it in your control to determine what this country is going to look like the next four years. Is it going to change? You get four more years of these lies. Mr. President, two minutes. So when I listened to Joe talking about a transition, uh, there's been no transition from when I won. I won that election. And if you look at crooked Hillary Clinton, if you look at all of the different people, uh, there was no transition because they came after me trying to do a coup. They came after me spying on my campaign. They started from the day I won and even before I won, from the day I came down the escalator with our first lady. They were a disaster. They were a disgrace to our country. And we've caught them. We've caught them all. We've got it all on tape. We've caught them all. And by the way, you gave the idea for the Logan Act against General Flynn. You better take a look at that because we caught you in a sense. And President Obama was sitting in the office. He knew about it too. So don't tell me about a free transition. As far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. A solicited ballot, okay, solicited is okay. You're soliciting. You're asking. They send it back. You send it back. I did that. If you have an unsolicited, they're sending millions of ballots all over the country. There's fraud. They found them in creeks. They found some with the name Trump. Just happened to have the name Trump just the other day in a waste paper basket. They're being sent all over the place. They sent two in a Democrat area. They sent out a thousand ballots. Everybody got two ballots. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. The other thing, it's nice on November 3rd, you're watching and you see who won the election. And I think we're going to do well, because people are really happy with the job we've done. But you know what? We won't know. We might not know for months, because these ballots are going to be all over. Take a look at what happened in Manhattan. Take a look at what happened in New Jersey. Take a look at what happened in Virginia and other places. They're not losing 2 percent, 1 percent, which, by the way, is too much. An election could be won or lost with that. They're losing 30 and 40 percent. It's a fraud, and it's a shame. And can you imagine where they say, uh, you have to have your ballot in by November 10th. November 10th. That means that's seven days after the election, in theory, should have been announced. Okay. We have major yes. states no, with that. Uh, sir, All run by two Democrats. Two minutes is two minutes. 
All it's run a, by Democrats. It's President a, Trump, it's a rigged I, I, election. I, you're going to be able to continue. You have been charging for months that mail-in balloting is going to be a disaster. You say it's rigged, yes. that it's going to lead to fraud. But in 2018, in the last midterm election, 31 million people voted mail-in voting. That was a quarter, more than a quarter, of all the voters that year cast their ballots by mail. Now that millions of mail-in ballots have gone out, what are you going to do about it? And are you counting on the Supreme Court, including a Justice Barrett, to settle any dispute? Yeah, I, th I think I'm counting on them to look at the ballots, definitely. I don't think we'll, I hope we don't need them in terms of the election itself. But for the ballots, I think so, because what's happening is incredible. I just heard, I read today, where at least 1 percent of the ballots for 2016 were invalidated. They, they take them. We don't like them. We don't like them. But they what throw are you them do out about left if there right. are millions of ballots going out right now? What you do is you go do? and vote. You do a solicited ballot, no, no, and that's I'm okay, not, or you complaint. go and vote. I'm asking you about the fact that millions of people— You go and vote. You go and no, vote, but like they, is, like they used to the in the old— millions of people— You either do, Chris, a solicited ballot where you're sending it in, they're sending it back, and you're sending— they have mailmen with lots of it. Did you see what's going on? Take a look at West Virginia, mailmen selling the ballots. They're being sold. They're being dumped in rivers. This is a horrible thing for our country. There is no. This is not. There is no. This is not going to end well. There is okay. no evidence. This is of that. not Vice, going Vice to President end well. Five states in fact, have had mail-in ballots for the last decade or more. Five, including two Republican states. And you don't have to solicit the ballot. It's sent to you. It's sent to your home. What we're saying is, they're saying is that it has to be a postmark by the time, by election day. If it doesn't get in till the seventh, eighth, ninth, it still should be counted. He's just afraid of counting the votes. Because You're wrong. The You're wrong. I, no, I, I want to continue with you on this, I love yeah, Vice President vote. Biden. Because Chris, he's so wrong in, when he makes his statement no, like that. Excuse me. Vice President Biden, the biggest problem, in fact, over the years with mail-in voting has not been fraud, historically. It has been that sizable numbers, sometimes hundreds of thousands of ballots are thrown out because they have not been properly filled out or there is some other irregularity or they missed the deadline. So the question I have is, are you concerned that the Supreme Court with a Justice Barrett will settle any dispute? I am concerned that any court would settle this because here's the deal. When you, when you file, when you get a ballot and you fill it out, you're supposed to have an affidavit. If you didn't know, you have someone say that this is me. You should be able to, if in fact you can verify that's you when the, before the ballot is thrown out, that's sufficient to be able to count the ballot because someone made a mistake and not dotting the correct I. Who they voted for, testify, say who they voted for, say it's you, that is totally legitimate. All right. Excuse me, no, no, no. when you I have, have a 80 final, million I, ballots I have a final sent in and swamping the I, I, system, I, you, 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 you know it can't be done. You know it can't. And already all right. there's been so now fraud. Mail service final, delivers 185 million pieces of mail a day. Wait a minute, gentlemen. In the final question, in eight ballots. states, we can keep talking. It's, it's, in eight it's states, election workers are Here prohibited, is. currently by law, eight states, from even beginning to process ballots, even take them out of the envelopes and yes. flatten them until Election Day. That means that it's likely, because there's going to be a huge increase in mail-in balloting, that we are not going to know on election night who the winner is, that it could be days, it could be weeks, could be months. until we find out who the, the, the new president is. So I, first for you, sir, finally for the, for the vice president, I hope neither of you will interrupt the other, will you urge your supporters to stay calm during this extended period, not to engage in any civil unrest, and will you pledge tonight that you will not declare victory until the election has been independently certified? President Trump, I'm you go first. I'm urging my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully, because that's what has to happen. I am urging them to do it. As you know, today there was a big problem. In Philadelphia, they went in to watch. They were called poll watchers, a very safe, very nice thing. They were thrown out. They weren't allowed to watch. You know why? Because bad things happen in Philadelphia, bad things. And Are I you? am urging I am urging my people. I hope it's going to be a fair election. If it's a fair You're election, what? I am 100 percent on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't 
go along with that. And I'll tell and you what, what, does that from mean, a common sense, does that mean you're going to tell your means. people to take to it the It means screen? you have a fraudulent election. You're and sending you out 80 do? million ballots. They're not, they're not equipped to, these people aren't equipped to handle it, number one. Number two, okay. they cheat. They cheat. Hey, they found ballots in a waste paper basket three sure. days ago, and they all had the name right. military ballots. They were military. They all had the name Trump on them. Vice President you think Biden, that's good? And, and Vice President Biden, final question for you. Will you urge your supporters to stay calm while the vote is counted, and will you pledge not to declare victory until the election is independently certified? Yes, and here's the deal. We count the ballots, as you pointed out. Some of these ballots in some states can't even be opened until Election Day. And if there's thousands of ballots, it's going to take time to do it. And by the way, our military, they've been voting by ballots for since at the end of the Civil War, in effect. In effect. And that's and that's what's happen, going to happen. Why was it not? Why is it for them somehow not fraudulent? It's the same process. It's honest. No one has established at all that there is fraud related to mail-in ballots, that somehow it's a fraudulent process. It's already been established. It's, it's, Take uh, a look at uh, Carolyn uh, Maloney's I, I, race. I asked and you, now, you had an opportunity look at to respond. Carolyn Monroe. Go ahead. They have no idea what Vice happened. Vice President Biden, go ahead. He has no idea what he's talking about. Here's the deal. The fact is, I will accept it, and he will too. You know why? Because once the winner is declared after all the, all the ballots are counted, all the votes are counted, That'll be the end of it. That'll be the end of it. And if it's me, in fact, fine. If it's, if it's not me, I'll support the outcome. And I'll be a president not just for the Democrats. I'll be a president for Democrats and Republicans. And this guy— I want to see fact, an honest okay. ballot count. Gentlemen, we, you say that's the end Chris, of it? This is the I end of this debate? honest ballot count. We're going to leave it there. Too. Uh, I, to be continued as in more debates as we go on. Uh, president Trump— Vice President Biden, it's been an interesting hour and a half. I want to thank you both for participating in the first of three debates that you have agreed to engage in. We want to thank Case Western Reserve University yes. and the Cleveland Clinic for hosting this event. The next debate, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates, will be one week from tomorrow, October 7th, at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. The two vice presidential nominees, Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris, We'll debate at 9 p.m. Eastern that night. We hope you watch. Until then, thank you and good night. If hearing that this debate is over was music to your ears, you may not be alone. Uh, what could have been a low point in American political discourse, certainly in any modern uh, debate we've seen, just took place over an hour and a half. If you showed up looking for a food fight, you got uh, a brawl between these two men, a language that uh, we have rarely heard from candidates uh, in, a, in a political debate, um, a name-calling that, that went to a new level. Uh, frankly, Savannah Guthrie, I'm, I'm a bit at of loss for words here to describe what we've just witnessed. Well, maybe because I think, like so many in this country watching this, you, your jaw just dropped. You can't pretend that this was a normal debate, a normal example of American democracy at, at work, a normal, you know, tussle between foes. This was different. This was a, a, an all-out grudge match. It was undignified at many times. It was cringeworthy at many times. Um, and you, you just, uh, as I turned to Chuck, we can't pretend, and I can't go to you, Chuck, with my normal give me some political I analysis know. question, because I think we need right. to just pause for a moment and say, that was crazy. What was that? It was a train wreck. Um, but it was a train wreck of the making of one person. I mean, we know who did it. President Trump did this. Uh, and in some ways, it's the only way he knows what to do. He bulldozed over the moderator, he bulldozed over Chris Wallace, bulldozed, um, and at times flustered Joe Biden. But I don't know if anybody wouldn't have been flustered um, by the president's behavior and the president's performance. Um, it, it, it is. It was a pure train wreck. I don't know how that helped anybody. If, if you were watching this as an undecided voter, I don't know if it helped at all. Uh, it, you just, I don't know what you learned. Well, did you stay I mean, on the channel? Very, I got a lot of texts from people I saying I turned it off. Yeah, I've gotten a lot of those comments too, both from true outsiders and from friends and family. A lot of people seem to turn this one off. It is, it is, um, I, again, I go back, I'm trying to figure out and I'm trying to find, okay, did this politically help anybody? I will say this. Joe Biden's campaign has been trying to make the case, essentially, 
that President Trump is a fraud, a bully, and has no plans. That was one thing that seemed to get through, I think, at times, and certainly President Trump played the role of the bully quite well. The Trump campaign has been trying to paint Joe Biden as out of it and captive of the left. Uh, I think his folks are going to think that the president scored some points here or there. But I, you know, I'm looking at it, I think a lot of people are going to look at this and, and feel perhaps a tad empathetic for anybody that had to participate in this. Uh, let me go to Andrea Mitchell right now. Uh, Andrea, many of the things that we talked about in the last couple of days came true in terms of the president's strategy to try to get under uh, Joe Biden's skin. Uh, he went after his son Hunter on, yeah. on a, a number of occasions, including uh, when Vice President Biden was talking about uh, his son Bo, who had died uh, honorably serving as a soldier. True. Uh, I mean, but this was such a hot mess. You can you can fault Joe Biden perhaps for letting the president get him rattled and for not drilling down on the tax issue and other issues. But frankly, the format and that you have to you have to fault the moderator in the way the questions were posed. Once President Trump was rolling over them and bulldozing them, because they didn't talk about COVID nearly uh, as much as race and violence and protests. I mean, it was really, really in the ballpark of the president because he kept bringing things back to that issue and not letting Joe Biden answer a question. So by blowing it all up and running roughshod over everyone else, he didn't let Joe Biden make the points that he was prepared to make until perhaps the last half hour, last hour, perhaps 45 minutes, where Biden seemed to regain his footing. And the contrast was clear, but I, I've been watching debates, covering debates since 1976. I've never seen anything like this. I don't think any of us have. Compare it to any debate in presidential history. Uh, this was a disgrace, frankly. And uh, the president just did not observe any of the format that his own campaign had agreed to. So I'm not sure what Joe Biden could have done other than trying to get a word in and uh, trying to answer the questions that were asked. Well, let me go to Hallie Jackson, who is at the debate hall. I mean, a couple of things here. The, the famous maxim inside Trump world is let Trump be Trump. He definitely was Trump, but even even kind of a supersized version of himself. So whether or not that was part of the strategy, I'd like to hear you on whether or not the, the campaign was going in there with that motivation. And Biden, on the other hand, uh, he did have his opportunities. Did he make the most of them or did he did he lose opportunities? A couple of things on that, Savannah. When you talk about the idea of, of the president's strategy going into this and the idea of letting Trump be Trump, as is so often said, listen, the campaign uh, sources close to the preparations here had said they wanted to see the president go on attack. That was part of what they were coming into this with. Obviously, that happened. That was an incredibly aggressive Donald Trump on stage tonight. Uh, he went after, as expected, Hunter Biden multiple <laughs> times, of course, the vice president's son. You talk about, Savannah, Vice President Biden being on defense in, to that degree, because of the nature of the interruptions, frankly, from the president, it seemed like it was difficult for Joe Biden to be able to push back in any substantive way when the president was sort of rat-a-tat-tat with these attacks uh, on Biden repeatedly over and over again on Hunter Biden. I can tell you that there is already uh, sort of appreciation from people in Trump world for those Hunter Biden attacks. That is something you're going to be hearing over the next 24, 48 hours and beyond. As Chuck points out, there are some different moments that people who support President Trump are seizing on to, to say, listen, he was on his game. He had energy is, is sort of the, the thinking here. He came out and attacked. On the other hand, I think it is notable when we talk about the substance of this debate, a couple of points uh, and things that the president simply did not say. It, it cannot go unnoticed that Joe Biden, the former vice president, directly called President Trump a racist. President Trump did not respond to that. The president was directly asked to denounce white supremacy and the Proud Boys. The president said, stand back and stand by, which is not a denunciation. The president was directly asked to urge calm to his supporters during the vote count ahead of Election Day. President Trump did not not do that. I think substantively, those are some of the things that you're going to be hearing about over the next couple of days. And just to give you a sense, I have to tell you, inside this debate hall, I've, I've been to other debates. This was very different for a lot of reasons, notably from some of the COVID precautions and the much smaller audience. It was a much more intimate hall feeling, and that made it jarring, frankly, to see this chaos on the stage go down, just as somebody who is inside the room here. 
All right, let's bring in our guest, Rich Lowry, editor of the National Review. Also, uh, Claire McCaskill, former Democratic senator from Missouri. Both are NBC News political uh, contributors. Uh, uh, senator, let me first talk to you about you know, there's a lot of focus, obviously, on what Donald Trump did and, and his performance. But isolating, if you can, Joe Biden, his reaction to it, his uh, losing his temper at, at times, how much does that hurt him? I, I listen. I, anybody who tries to characterize this debate as somehow equivalent in terms of the behavior of those two candidates is not being fair to Joe Biden. Donald Trump was a bully. He was non presidential. He was, fr frankly, outrageous. It was sad to watch it as an American. He's the president of the United States, and he behaved like a 12th grader. It was terrible. And Joe Biden, I think, showed presidential self-control. Now, did he call, tell him to be quiet a couple of times? Frankly, I'm, you know, I was watching. I wanted to throttle the guy. And Chris Wallace, I mean, I know it must be hard to control it, but he really got run over by Donald Trump's outrageous behavior on that stage tonight. Now, will it hurt Donald Trump politically? I'm not sure it will with his supporters. But I guarantee it won't help him with those women in the suburbs. It will not help him. Well, that was the question I wanted to ask Rich Lowry, who, of course, is the editor of the Conservative National Review. I mean, look, if you are a Donald Trump supporter, this was a, a great night for you. You love this guy. But what about those undecided voters? What about suburban women? What about people who are on the fence? Do you feel that aggressive uh, performance was a good look for Donald Trump? Well, I think the whole night was dispiriting. I I wouldn't be surprised if there's not another presidential debate in this cycle. And at the very least, I think the Presidential Debate Commission has to consider cutting off the mics of the people who aren't supposed to, the person who's not supposed to be speaking and whose time it isn't. But look, um, this was Trump's strategy. And even if it wasn't a strategy, this is his nature. This is the way he is. And I think, you know, he flustered Biden at times. The, the shut up man wasn't great at the beginning from, from Joe Biden. Biden was evasive on some key questions. But Really importantly, he didn't buckle. You know, he stood there for 90 minutes and took it and gave as good as he got. And with Trump, I think the problem is, especially with Hunter Biden, some of the points he was trying to make didn't really land that well because of his own jagged uh, style and his own over-interrupting. So I, I agree with Claire. I'm not sure it hurts him. But as someone who is unsettled by the way he's conducted himself as, as president but is on the fence about him, are they going to look at this performance and say, that's my guy? Unlikely. So it's probably a status quo debate, but it's Trump that needs a trajectory of this race to change. All right, Rich, thank you. We're going to take a quick break here. We'll be back with more on tonight's debate in just a moment. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. Got to get a four year degree, but a four year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. 
this morning across the country what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Ifill and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the post-debate analysis. I'll be hosting an NBC News town hall with Democratic nominee uh, Joe Biden on uh, Monday, uh, next Monday from uh, Miami at 8, uh, 7 central time. We hope you will join us then. Savannah? All right. As I turn to Casey Hunt, our Capitol Hill correspondent, I mean, debates are this kind of cherished ritual of our democracy and of presidential campaigns. A lot of folks remember watching them as little kids. Can you imagine uh, how you'd feel if you were a mom or dad with your kids watching that debacle tonight? I wonder what you're hearing from your sources on, on the Hill and in the campaigns. Do you think there's a chance that either one or both of the campaigns just says, Forget it. We're not doing any further debates. There are two more presidential debates scheduled, one vice presidential debate scheduled. Well, Savannah, first of all, I'm grateful my son was too young to watch that. Very different from the ones I remember watching as a young child, part of, of which made me want to be involved in the American political process in the first yeah, place. Might, and know, I think uh, there are certainly sources in both uh, parties who are currently uh, suggesting to me that perhaps it's Joe Biden at this point who should not participate in future debates. As we were negotiating up to this process, remember, there was a lot of concern about whether President Trump was going to be the one to show up. And a lot of the ways that this was negotiated, including the moderator choices and some other things, seemed to suggest that perhaps it was oriented at him. Uh, but now I've got more than one source who uh, are saying, hey, you know, maybe Joe Biden uh, doesn't benefit very much uh, from coming back out onto a stage like this, Savannah. All right, Casey, hold that thought. Another break now. We'll be back with some final reflections in just a moment. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. 
got to get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. We actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. This year's election is going to be a little different. Instead of one election day, we now have a voting season. That special time of year when polls can open weeks before election day. When your mailbox can become a voting booth. When how you vote is just as important as who you vote for. How, when, and where to cast your ballot depends on your state. Tis the season to be prepared. This year, plan your vote. Chuck Todd, final thought? Well, nothing else has changed the trajectory of this race, and even though we're all going to hand-ring about this debate tonight, I doubt this will change things much either. All right. And there are more debates to come next Wednesday. Vice presidential candidates Mike Pence and Kamala Harris face off in Salt Lake City. Then on October 15th, the second presidential debate. You may not be ready for more, but more is coming. A week later, the third and final debate moderated by our own Kristen Welker. Well, everybody, I'll see you tomorrow morning on Today. Until then, good night for all of us at NBC News. Thanks for being with us.